Hi there, I'm Lindsay Sparks, the author of the Echo Trilogy. I just wanted to do a quick intro for this next part of Time Anomaly. For those people who might be coming in to this video for the first time, this is the middle of a book, uh, so I would recommend going back to Time Anomaly Part 1 and starting there. Well, this is the second book in a series, and this is the second video for that audiobook. So I would recommend going back to the first book. All the links are in the info about the video down below. So you can find all the links to the previous audiobooks or parts of audiobooks that come before this. If this is where you are first starting, go back to Echo in Time Part 1. If you already listened to Echo in Time and Time Anomaly Part 1, then this is exactly where you want to be. So enjoy the story. <laughs> Part 3. Cairo, Egypt. Present Day. Chapter 18. Cat and Jenny. Dear Lex, it's Cat, by the way. You have been gone for hours, and Marcus is seriously starting to lose it, just so you know. He destroyed your suite. Like, complete and utter destruction. If that's what true love looks like, I'm definitely not ready for anything close to that. But anyway, Dom said he saw you in the aught, and he thought you were trying to tell him that you were in another time. I'm writing this to you on the chance that you time-jumped into the future. If you're reading this, please, just come back. Nephi's been monitoring Marcus, and she said his withdrawals have already started. She and Dom were talking super quietly, but I think they forgot that my Nezuret traits are starting to kick in and, you know, that I could hear a little better. Anyway, I overheard them saying that they didn't think he'd last more than a week without you, which means you won't last a week without him. You have to come back. We're all so worried about you. Please, just come back. Your half says, Cat. Cat! Jenny called from the bathroom. Do you want me to leave the straightener on? Jenny wasn't really my sister, but she was sort of like my sister, since she was Lex's half-sister, and Lex was my half-sister. Whatever, it didn't matter. All that mattered was that Jenny was as freaked about Lex's disappearance as I was, and in my book, which is the book that made us family. Abandoning my notebook and pen, I rolled off the ginormous bed and headed toward the bathroom door. Nope, not like it'll do any good in this heat. The straightening iron hadn't tamed my dark, frizzy curls in Florence, and I doubted it would do any better in Cairo. Jenny and I had been sharing a room since the set incident, as we've been calling what happened in the underground temple. I'd tried staying with my mom at first, but she was still pissed at me about risking my life. I roll for Lex so I'd asked Jenny if I could stay with her for a while. It is weird that Mom didn't even argue, though. I leaned my shoulder against the doorframe and watched Jenny stare at herself in the mirror, her mouth open as she put on mascara. Are you sure that's such a good idea? I asked. We'd both been a blink away from crying like two-year-olds since Dom told us about Lex's disappearance. Jenny offered me a watery smile in the mirror. It's a deterrent. If I know my mascara will smear, I won't cry. She crossed her fingers. I'm hoping. I looked at my naked wrist. Jay, it's like four in the morning, and we're all going to look like crap from being up all night anyway. Why even try? Jenny lowered her mascara wand and sighed. Grandma Suze, that's Alexander's wife? She always says that the best way to get through the worst times is to do normal things. Go to work, clean, get ready. Jenny shrugged and looked away, but I could see her chin trembling in the mirror. She cleared her throat. So that's what I'm doing, she said as she returned her attention to her reflection and raised the mascara wand to her other eye. Normal things. Pushing off the doorframe, I stepped into the bathroom to stand beside her. I reached for the straightening iron and moved it closer to me before finger coming through my long, frizzy curls and picking out a section to start with. I raised the straightener to my hair. Normal things. 
My eyes flicked down to the reflection of Jenny's belly. She was just starting to show under her sweater. Is that how you've been dealing with, you know? With another sigh, Jenny jabbed the mascara wand into the tube and turned to face me, resting her hip on the edge of the pale granite counter. At first, yeah, but not anymore. Looking down, she touched her barely there baby bump. It's not the baby's fault, and I'm going to love him or her no matter how psychotic their dad is, because you and Lex and Dom, you're all Seth's, Seth's kids too, and there's nothing wrong with you guys. I looked at my reflection in the mirror and ran the hot iron down the length of my hair. Every day I saw more and more of my dad in my face, like his sharp features were taking over. Or maybe it was just an illusion caused by my paling skin. So annoying. I'd worked really hard to build up a tan this summer, and now my Nezirette regenerative abilities were wiping it away like it had never existed. I glared at my reflection. I hate you, Set. And I couldn't help but wonder if maybe Jenny was wrong. What if Set's evilness would somehow spill over into their kid? What if it had spilled over into me? Did you ever consider, um, not, um, you know, having the baby? I asked her. Jenny laughed softly. You can say abortion. I won't freak out. She touched my shoulder and headed out of the bathroom. But no, I didn't. I guess it's just not something I could bring myself to do. I could hear her rummaging around in the wardrobe. Lex would, I think. She never really wanted kids anyway. She always had a one-track mind, and up until she met Marcus, that single track was all about Egypt, which could be so annoying, let me tell you. She was quiet for a moment, and there was the sound of more rummaging. Ah, there they are. But maybe, now that Marcus is in her life, she'll change her mind about starting a family. She doesn't know. She can't, I said softly. Jenny appeared in the doorway, slipping on some sky blue ballet flats. What was that? I swallowed and met her eyes in the mirror. Lex can't have kids. Why? Because of her position as the mezwet or whatever? I shook my head and refocused on my own reflection, moving on to a new section of hair. Nezirets can't have kids once they manifest. It's impossible. Jenny's eyes went wide, and she brought her hand up to her mouth. Oh, I... I didn't know. She frowned and looked down at the floor. I'm sorry, that's... That must be so awful. I can't imagine. I shrugged. I've known for pretty much ever, so it's no biggie for me. It's normal, just the way it is, you know. But for someone like Lex, who wasn't raised knowing what she might be, yeah, finding it out would suck balls. I rolled my eyes and exhaled heavily. I bet that was a fun convo for Alexander. Jenny continued to stare at the floor, but she brought her arms up to her belly and wrapped them around her middle. Her shoulders were shaking. I set down the straightener and turned to her. Hey, Jay. I rubbed my hands up and down her arms, crouching down a little so I could see her face. It's cool, really, I'm fine with it. Jenny shook her head. Dark smears of mascara bled from her lower lashes. I'm just so scared for Lex. I mean, I just got her back now. A hiccuping sob cut her words short, and her shoulders shook even harder. Now? I don't know if I'll ever see her again. I wrapped my arms around Jenny and held her tightly while she cried, fighting tears of my own. Some people sympathy vomit or sympathy yawn, but I'd always been a horrible sympathy crier. Of course, the fact that I was afraid of the same damn thing didn't help one damn bit. The tears broke free. Damn. Someone started knocking on the sweet door. Knocking and knocking and knocking. Growling under my breath, I released Jenny and stomped to the door. What? I said as I yanked it open. 
Dominic was standing in the hallway, with his fist still raised. I studied him with scrutinizing eyes. For once, his prim and proper shell seemed to be cracked. His normally slicked-back hair hung in dark ribbons around his face. His eyes were shadowed, and his shirt was untucked, the top few buttons undone. You look like crap, I told him, gaining at least a teensy bit of pleasure from seeing him so out of sorts. He was my usual instructor in how to use my new superpowers, and sometimes he could be such a... Nephi has need of you, and Jenny, in the lab, he said, rubbing his face with his knocking hand before lowering it down to his side. His accent was heavier, which meant he was really freaking exhausted. The lab? What lab? I cocked my head to the side. There's a lab? It is underground, in the basement too. I held up my hand. Hold on a sec here, buddy. This place has an underground? What does she need? Jenny asked from behind me. I glanced over my shoulder to find that she'd wiped the dark smudges from her red-rimmed eyes. She thinks she may have come up with a way to decrease the severity of Marcus's withdrawal symptoms. But she needs both of you in order to test her theory. I huffed out a breath. Jeesh, Dom, why didn't you just say so in the first place? I pushed past him and through the doorway and headed down the hall toward the nearest set of stairs. I did. Are there going to be needles involved? I asked Nephi as I sat on a metal stool beside Jenny. We were in the lab, in sub-basement two, having taken somewhat hidden elevators from the ground floor, where the above-ground parts of the council's Cairo palace were very antique and low-tech. The underground was about as ultra-modern and high-tech as I could imagine. Everything was stainless steel, or polished white, or pristine glass, and with a lack of windows, I felt like I was on some sort of futuristic spaceship. When Nephi didn't respond, I added, "'Cause I'm not a big fan of needles.' Nephi paused in prepping her microscope slide and met my eyes, looking bored. She took a deep breath, exhaling heavily, then returned her attention to her equipment. Okay, never mind, I didn't want an answer anyway, I muttered. Nephi stilled, closing her eyes for a moment. You are a saint, she said, glancing at Dominic, who was standing opposite her at a high stainless steel table. Jenny coughed, and I was pretty sure she was masking a laugh. I glared at each of them in turn. Finally, Nephi gave Jenny and me her full attention. Are you sweating? My eyebrows knitted together. Uh, no? Why? I looked at Jenny, who shook her head. Nephi waved her hand at the open floor space in front of our stools. Do some jumping jacks. Jenny and I exchanged a look as we stood and moved a couple steps away from each other. Half-heartedly, I started hopping and flailing my arms, looking anywhere but at Dominic. I hated that he was watching me look so stupid. How long, feet together, do we have to, feet apart, do this, I asked. Feet together, feet apart, feet together. Nephi offered me a tight smile. Until you sweat. I bared my gritted teeth to her. Great. She looked at Dominic. Will you please hunt down my father? I will need him to be present to test the effectiveness of the synthesized pheromone cocktail. Standing, Dominic nodded. I will send him right down. He started toward the door. Thank you, Dom, Nephi said. She glanced at me. And please, hurry. Five minutes later, I was most definitely starting to sweat. I stopped doing jumping jacks and plopped down on my stool. Jenny did the same. Nephi planted herself in front of us. You are sweating? Jenny and I both nodded. Good, take off your shirts. We stared at her for a few seconds. Uh, Jenny said in chorus with my indignant, what? Exhaling heavily through her nose, Nephi pressed her lips together. I need access to the sweat on the skin of your underarms. It is the easiest way for me to gather a sample of the various pheromones given off by your bodies. She held up a long cotton swab, and tilted her head to the side. 
I'm trying to save my father's and your sister's lives. So your unhindered cooperation would be appreciated. With another exchanged look, Jenny and I pulled our shirts over our heads. Luckily, Nephi had her samples and we were back to being fully clothed by the time Marcus pushed the lab door open. Because him walking in when we were topless would have been mortifying. I still think this is a waste of time, Nephi, Marcus said as he strode over to Nephi's workspace and eased down onto a stool. He looked awful, or as awful as he could ever look. I sighed and rethought what I'd written to Lex. True love, at least with someone who looked like him, might just be worth all the trouble. We sat and watched Nephi work for what felt like hours. I tried to make small talk with Jenny, but she looked almost as haggard as Marcus, and I didn't feel far behind. Nephi was the only one of us who didn't seem to be wilting under the weight of exhaustion and dark emotions. No, Nephi was handling the situation in an entirely different way. She was focusing on a problem she could solve. Maybe. The door opened, making all of us jump, but only Jenny, Nephi, and I actually looked at it. Marcus simply stared at the metal tabletop like he wasn't even there, which, I realized, might actually have been the case. Nothing was stopping him from spending his time searching the unstable ought for Lex. Dominic came into the lab ahead of a petite nejurette with a dark bob, bronze skin, and pixie-like features. Marcus, I am sorry, Dominic said. She demanded to see you right away. He stopped several paces away from Marcus, holding out his arm to block the woman from reaching him. She claims to know you, and to know how to help you. When Marcus still didn't turn around, Dominic glanced at Nephi, who frowned and shook her head. It looked like she didn't know the strange Nazareth either. Heru, the woman said, please. Marcus lifted his head and, ever so slowly, turned around on his stool. A uh, set? Chapter 19 Friend and Foe Marcus stood and approached the Nezirette like he was moving through tar. When he reached her, he raised his hand and touched the side of her face. You're real, he whispered. A set. How are you real? You died. I saw. But you didn't see, did you, brother? The woman, Aset, said with a hollow laugh. Set blinded you, and you only thought I'd been killed. You all thought I'd been killed, because you had to think that. But you never saw my body, dear brother. She covered his hand with her own, leaning her cheek against his palm and closing her eyes. Feel me, Heru. I am real. She opened her eyes and smiled up at him. I'm real. A choking sob escaped from Marcus, and he moved so quickly, raising his other hand and lowering his face to a set's, that it took me several seconds to register what he was doing. He was kissing her. My eyes bulged. It was nothing crazy, and... There was clearly no tongue or anything like that, but still, he was kissing someone who was definitely not Lex. Hey, Jenny stood and took a few steps toward them, but Nephi caught hold of her wrist. Jenny threw her free hand out toward Marcus and Asset in an almost violent gesture, just as the pair broke apart. But she's his sister, his twin sister, she said. It's nothing like what you're thinking. There was only one thing that I was thinking. Ew. Asat took a step back from Marcus and looked past him, her eyes settling first on Jenny, then on me. Don't worry. I have nothing but the utmost respect for your sister. I would never do anything to hurt her. And my love for Heru is purely that of a sister. I remained on my stool, bug-eyed, as I watched the scene before me. Lex, you know, Lex, Marcus said. How, do you know where she is? Asset nodded, 
her lips curving into a sad smile. I do, dear brother. I know where she is. And when. A collective heavy exhale filled the room. So you were right, Marcus said to Dom, who only nodded and continued to stare at Marcus's no longer deceased sister. Yes, yes, he was right. Lex is safe, blah, blah, blah. Asset shifted her canvas shoulder bag and started digging through it. A moment later, she pulled out a small carved wooden box. She handed it to Marcus. For you, from Lex. She gave this to you. He accepted the tiny container, but hardly looked at it. So you've seen her since I... Since the incident last night. Asat smiled. Who do you think drove the getaway car? My mouth fell open. Heru's sister kidnapped Lex? I stared at Dom and Marcus, not understanding why they weren't hauling her away to interrogate her. Long story short. I want the long story, Marcus said. Asat pursed her lips. And I'll give you the long story once we're on our way. Where are we? She raised one hand and a sharp motion, cutting him off. Lex is with Nguyen, and with you and me, in Mennefer, a month or two before Nguyen's death. I don't remember how many days exactly. She traveled back over four millennia? When Asat nodded, Marcus shook his head. That block of time has always been a bit of a fuzzy spot in my memory. And now you know why. Because Lex tapped into the power Nguyen gave her and made me forget. Actually, she made you remember a slightly altered version of events, but essentially, yes, she sealed your true memories away. Asat touched the side of the box. She made this for you, so you would be able to survive while she's gone. My eyes could have been tricking me. I mean, I hadn't blinked for at least two minutes, so it was entirely possible. But I thought I could see Marcus's hands tremble as he opened the box. He pulled out a tiny crystal bottle, attached to a silver chain, heavy enough not to look too girly on a guy, but not thick enough to look like a ridiculous gangsta chain. He held the bottle up in front of his face. This isn't quartz, is it? Asat shook her head. It is made of the art itself. She took it from his hands and lifted it, standing on tiptoes to raise it over his head. She settled a chain around his neck, tucking the tiny bottle into his shirt. And inside, it is packed full of Lex's bonding pheromones. All you have to do is have it touching your skin. And you should be fine. For a while. But you must not open the bottle, or the pheromones will float away. Marcus touched his fingertips to the little lump under his shirt. Better? Asset asked, studying his face. He nodded and took a full, deep breath. Much. And what about Lex? Her eyes most definitely twinkled. Trust me when I say Lex is doing just fine. Marcus shook his head. How? You forget, dear brother. She touched her fingertips to his chiseled cheek. Lex has you. Marcus said nothing for several seconds. You mentioned going somewhere. Already his voice sounded less tight, less strained, and he stood a little taller. Yes, Asset said, readjusting her shoulder bag. We must leave for the Netgerant Oasis immediately. Lex has left you something there that I think you'll be eager to see. She left me something. From the past. Yes, and only once we've gone to the oasis and explored what she left behind will she return. She nodded once. This I know. Very well. Marcus strode toward the door, Dom and Asset close on his heels. During the journey, you will tell me everything you know about what is going on with Lex, he said to Asset over his shoulder. He opened the door and held it for the other two to pass through the doorway. I will tell you what I can, Asset said as the door swung shut. Stunned by pretty much everything that had just happened, I stared at the door, until Nephi clapped her hands repeatedly. What are you just standing around for? Go make yourselves useful. 
We're leaving soon. For once, I had no retort. I hopped off my stool and hurried to the door. Go, Nephi repeated, and I heard Jenny rushing along behind me. I stuffed my favorite pair of jeans into my duffel bag, which also happened to be the only pair of jeans I'd packed from Seattle, which, honestly, I thought was showing a ton of restraint, then pulled them back out and tossed them on the bed. Skinny jeans and the Sahara did not seem like an epic combination. But just as I was zipping up the bag, I stuffed them back in. Dominic barged into the room. No knock, no apology, just barging. Why aren't you ready yet? I could have been naked, I said, crossing my arms over my minuscule chest. You really should have knocked. He stood in the doorway and stared at me. But you weren't. No, but I could have been. It's about respect, you know? I quirked my mouth to the side. He furrowed his brow, looking, of all things, confused. Men. You would have knocked for Lex. Lex would already have been packed and downstairs. Dom raised his eyebrows lazily. Who even does that? I would not have had to retrieve her. I rolled my eyes. Well, in case you haven't noticed, I'm not Lex. I have, but I am not the one who keeps comparing you to the mess with. I rolled my eyes again and hoisted my duffel bag onto my shoulder before reaching for the messenger bag containing my more personal items. So, what's this oasis place like, anyway? Is it filled with springs and palm trees and camels that spit and... You've watched too many movies. I approached the doorway, and the new door formerly known as Dominic, stopping in front of him to show him my ha-ha, you're so funny face. I'm 18, which means I'm still a teenager. Note the teen. That means watching movies is practically part of my job. It's like school. Dom stared down at me, those dark eyes seeming to dig into my soul and to weigh its worth. He didn't look impressed. You received your diploma. You no longer attend school. Only because Marcus's people had arranged it right before we left Seattle. Whatever. Move? He didn't. I batted my eyelashes at him and smiled sweetly. Please? Dom sighed and stepped out of my way. I paused in the hallway to wait for him as he shut the door. Such a gentleman. My big, stuffier-than-an-antique-shop brother. You never answered my question. What's this Netgerat oasis like? And how come I've never heard of it, if it's, like, a thing? Dom smoothed his hair back and started walking toward the stairs, and I fell in step beside him. We don't speak of it, he said. Why not? Because the oasis is where the great father's body lies. I stopped dead in my tracks in the middle of the hallway. Wait, what? We know where Nguyen's body is? And it's not a sacred place? How is this oasis not our Mecca? A great disaster befell it thousands of years ago, immediately after Nguyen's death. And the desert reclaimed it. And since then, it has not been spoken of except amongst the closest of friends. It is somewhat of a taboo topic. He continued on down the hall, and I had to speed walk to keep up. But why? Why all the mystery and secrecy and stuff? Why don't we ever talk about it or what happened there? It is simply our way. It is tradition. You should respect it. I could almost hear him silently saying, You should respect me. I rolled my eyes again. Dozens of us stood in the Cairo Palace's marble and gold grand entryway, all of our attention on Marcus and Asset, who were posted before the doors. Marcus was making his final announcements and doing a half-assed job at taking roll call. We are leaving in 15 minutes, Marcus said. If you see that someone is missing, find them before we leave. We are going with or without them. Clearly, solving the problem of his withdrawal symptoms hadn't improved his mood much. I glanced around the cavernous space, scanning the backs of heads and faces of each person. I reached for Dom's sleeve and gave it a tug. When he shot me a sideways glance, I said, My mom's not here. I've got to go get her. 
pressing his lips together, Dom shrugged. I dropped my bags on the polished marble stairs and turned to run back up, but a hand latched around my elbow before I'd made it up two steps. I turned. Dom, what? Hurry, he said, his dark eyes intense. Sometimes he looked so much like Set, it was creepy. Um, I nodded, and when he released me, I raced up the stairs that much faster. I ran down the hall past the room I was sharing with Jenny, skidded around a corner, heading for my mom's room, and lunged forward the last few steps, falling to my knees, because there, on the floor in front of her door, was Jenny, blood seeping through the crotch of her khaki pants. I didn't even hesitate. Dumb! Chapter 20 Death and Threat Dumb! He rounded the corner at a near sprint and seemed to assess the situation in a matter of seconds. Nephi, he called over his shoulder. We need you. It's Jenny. Something has happened. I reached for Jenny's hand, squeezing it, but not too hard because it was limp and felt so fragile, and I didn't want to break her, and there was so much blood. Nephi glided around the corner, as Set and Marcus close on her heels. What is it? She said, but she didn't wait for an answer. She shouldered Dom out of the way as she crouched on the other side of Jenny, reaching for her wrist. Her pulse is weak. She focused on the blood seeping through Jenny's pants, staining the fabric crimson, then shifted her focus to me. You've been spending a lot of time with her. Has she complained of any discomfort? Cramping? Bleeding? I... I... Swallowing, and unable to tear my eyes away from the blood, I nodded. My mom. She... She... Nephi reached across Jenny's body and closed her hand around my wrist, her nails digging into my skin. Your mother what? My eyes wide. I shook my head. So much blood. It was only hours ago that Jenny had been talking about the baby, about how she was going to love it no matter what. And now, now, what if she was losing it? Cat! I blinked, but couldn't look away. Dom knelt beside me. Let go, Nephi. As Nephi released my wrist, Dom captured my hand. Look at me, cat. His voice was gentle. Look at me. I did, and it was like I'd been underwater but had just broken through the surface and could breathe. I stared into his dark eyes, thinking they weren't nearly as cold and boring as I thought. They were guarded. They held secrets. They were filled with emotion, turmoil, desperation, anger, not devoid of it like I'd pretended. You mentioned your mother. Cat, why? I rubbed my thumb over the back of Jenny's hand. Jenny, she started feeling nauseous, like, all the time. I told her she should tell Nephi, but my mom stopped by our room before she could and started asking Jenny about her pregnancy and how she was feeling. I frowned. I remember thinking it was weird that she was being so chatty with Jenny because she hadn't said much to me since I switched rooms. And what happened next? Thumb's voice was coaxing his accent soothing rather than irritating, like I used to think. And my mom told her she'd felt the same when she was pregnant, with me, and then said that nothing the doctors gave her had helped, but that Marcus showed her how to make an ancient Nejere medicine. That was the only thing that helped her. She told Jenny that the nausea was only the beginning, and that cramping would soon follow, but that if Jenny took the medicine my mom made for her, she'd avoid the worst of it. I never showed Jen how to make anything like that, Marcus said, a razor-sharp edge to his voice. How long has she been taking this medicine? Aset asked. I looked at her. Um, since we got to Cairo? I shrugged. So, like four or five days? I started shaking my head. But my mom would never. The concoction could have been tainted with a bacteria. Aset said, maybe E. coli or Listeria. The girl likely would have assigned any symptoms caused by the infection to her pregnancy. You have medical training, Nephi said. 
It wasn't a question. I do. Asad glanced at Marcus. I was the doctor who treated Lex last year. After... Marcus clenched his jaw so hard that I was surprised I didn't hear the sound of his teeth breaking. Did you know what that piece of shit would do to her? Asat didn't even blink an eye at his seething tone. I did. And you didn't try to stop it? And I was starting to worry about Asat's safety as Marcus glared at her. If looks could kill, she would have died, like... 8,000 times in a few seconds. Asset pursed her lips and raised her eyebrows. Lex is the one who told me when and where I had to be so she and I would meet when she first woke in the hospital. She told me it had to happen that way. Um, guys? I stared down at Jenny's washed out face. Shouldn't we be doing something to help Jenny and the baby? My words seemed to shake Marcus out of his outraged trance, and he started barking orders. Nephi, do what you need to do for Jenny, and when you know more, let me know what kind of delay we're looking at. Nephi bowed her head. Yes, father. She looked at Asad, who nodded and moved closer to her, and the two Nezirets started speaking in hushed tones. Dom, Marcus said, arrange a team to search for Jen. Find her. Dominic was up and running down the hall as soon as Marcus's order was voiced. Marcus turned eyes that burned like the sun on me. You don't leave my sight. I gulped. It was all I could do to make myself nod. Jen's gone, Dom said as he strode into the sitting room next to the entryway where Marcus, Asset, and I had been waiting, surrounded by Lex's full retinue of guards, in my opinion, it was less of a sitting room and more of a ballroom with fancy things like settees and chaise lounges. Dominic stopped on the enormous, intricately patterned rug in front of the armchair where Marcus was sitting. The security cameras caught her sneaking away last night during the chaos after you, he cleared his throat, after Lex vanished. I have our people working on tracking her down. Asset said something to Marcus, in a language that sounded a little bit like the Nejere language, but whatever they were speaking was different enough that I couldn't understand them. But I could understand their tones. Snippy. Just like a brother and sister should sound, I thought. So she left to go do something, I shrugged nonchalantly, feeling anything but nonchalant. I don't see why you guys are so hell-bent on finding her. I mean, it might all have been an accident. And Jenny and the baby are fine. Nephi said so. So she didn't actually hurt anyone. It wasn't that I was an idiot. At least not most of the time. But this was my mom they were hunting down. My mom. She wasn't the kind of person who would do something like poison a woman in an attempt to make her miscarry. She was the type of person who helped people, not hurt them. Yeah, if you looked up denial in the dictionary, only the guilty run, Dom said. She ran. But Marcus straightened in his chair, stretching his back. Leaning forward, he rested an elbow on his knee and rubbed his hand over his short hair. That is not always true, Dom. He exhaled a heavy sigh. Pull our people back in. We'll need all the trustworthy help we can get at the Oasis. Dom bowed his head, then turned and walked toward the doorway. Wait. Marcus lifted his head to look at Dom. I want Lex's parents and grandmother here before we leave. Are you intending for them to accompany us to the Oasis? Dom asked. I am. Dom's eyes narrowed the slightest amount. You understand that by doing this, you'll likely have to reveal the truth about us to Alice and Joe. Marcus nodded. It was bound to happen eventually. Lex will not be pleased. Lex isn't here. Marcus snapped, earning mutters from the guards stationed around the room and a tisk from his sister. 
But she will be more displeased if she returns to find them dead. That shut everyone up. They're coming with us. Work out the details with Alex. He's upstairs with Nephi in Jenny's room. Again, Dom bowed his head and walked toward the doorway. I licked my lips and switched from watching Dom to looking at Marcus. If you ever do find my mom, I hesitated. What are you going to do to her? Marcus stared at me for a long time, his face tense. Alex is demanding Nejere justice, but... He sighed. He'd been doing that a lot lately. I've loved Jen like a sister for a long time. He shook his head. I won't sanction her death until we know everything. Her guilt, her motivations, her accomplices, and only if her overall intent was malicious. Sanction her death. I swallowed, cleared my throat, licked my lips, swallowed again. There was a metallic taste in my mouth, and I wondered if I might vomit. And what about me? You will swear an oath, just as Dom did centuries ago, just as all of such children must do, and be adopted into my line. It would have been required of you upon full manifestation anyway. And if I don't? My voice was tiny, too high. His eyes burned into me. You already know the answer to that question. He was right, and I nodded. All of Seth's children were given a choice. Swear an oath to obey Marcus absolutely and completely, and Nezirets took oaths very seriously. Or die. It was by the council's edict, and was only by Marcus's tireless arguing on our behalf that we weren't all put to death immediately. Everyone knew it. Lex didn't have to swear the oath. Shut up, I screamed at myself, but for some idiotic reason, I just kept on blabbing. She's Seth's daughter too, but... She's also my bondmate. Marcus's lips spread into a cruel grin. You are not. He leaned forward, resting both of his elbows on his knees. I'm not known for my patience and mercy. Cat, be careful. Be careful of w what? I hated myself for stuttering, but sometimes Marcus could be really effing scary. How does Lex do it? Of everything. A breath. Five. A dozen. Okay, I said, nodding. I'll swear the oath. Chapter 21 Sand and Stone Katerina, my dearest daughter, I know what you must think of me, but I had to do it, and I had to run to leave you behind, for now. I'm doing this for you, for us. There is a group who can help free you. You'll be able to be your own person free to make your own choices instead of being a slave to Nejere hierarchy. The Council of Seven will not be in charge forever. A revolution is coming. I only wish I'd caught wind of it before you were forced to manifest. I'm so sorry I couldn't save you this eternal pain. So you see, I had to accept this task. I had to do what must be done to protect us once the revolution happens. By harming the Mezwet's sister and getting rid of Set's unborn offspring, I'm proving that my loyalty doesn't lie with Set or with the council, that I'm trustworthy and capable, and that I'd be a worthy member of the opposition. I'll send for you as soon as I know it's safe for you to join us. It's possible that you will be required to prove where your loyalty lies as well before you'll be allowed to join me. But I know you'll do the right thing. I'll keep you updated. Destroy this letter and do not, under any circumstances, tell anyone about what I've told you. If the wrong people find out, 
We're both dead. Remember, it's always been you and me, Cat, And it'll always be you and me. I love you, sweetheart. I'll see you soon. Love, Mom. Cat. Dom knocked on the bathroom door. Are you all right? Are you sick? I'm fine, I said weakly. Just, just a little, a little overwhelmed. That's all. I stared at the single crinkled piece of paper I'd found balled up and stuffed into one of my sneakers when I'd been repacking my duffel bag, watching it shake in my grasp. Something was crushing my chest, making it impossible to draw a full breath. She was delusional. My mom was delusional. These were my people, my family, and she wanted me to betray them, to help some group of crazy people start a revolution and overthrow the council. But she was still my mom. I tore the letter into tiny pieces and dropped it in the toilet, flushing without hesitation. I wouldn't betray Marcus and Lex and the others, but I wouldn't betray my mom either. After taking a deep, steadying breath, then another, I opened the bathroom door. Dominic was leaning against the side of the wardrobe, only a few steps away, his arms crossed over his chest and his eyebrows drawn together. His expression smoothed as I emerged. Are you all right? I nodded. His eyes scanned my face, almost like he was searching for something. He frowned. A set came by while you were in the bathroom. They're ready to depart. I glanced at the bed, where Jenny lay, sedated and unconscious, but healthy enough. Do I have time to say goodbye? Dom nodded and moved across the room toward the foot of the bed. I followed, moving around to the side to sit in the chair I'd been using for the past few hours. Do you think she'll be able to hear me? I asked, taking hold of her cool hand. Dom shrugged. Perhaps, perhaps not. But there is no harm in believing it. Swallowing roughly, I stared at him. You'll keep her safe. I swear it, he said, with the slightest bow of his head. Okay, good. That's good. Because not much terrified me more than the thought of my mom returning to finish what she'd started. I gave Jenny's hand a squeeze and leaned in closer to whisper my goodbyes. It's so... sandy, I said, staring out the passenger window of the jeep I was sharing with a negere named Carson. Dom, Nephi, and Alexander had remained back in Cairo, giving Jenny time to recover and regain her strength while also waiting for Lex's parents and grandma. They wouldn't be arriving for another week so I'd been handed off to someone else for the trip west into the Sahara. Carson laughed. It was a low, gentle sound, a soothing sound. I decided I liked his laugh. I just wished I felt like laughing, too. Your first time out in the Red Land? I glanced at him, frowning. Huh? Carson smiled at me, risking looking away from the caravan of other jeeps stretching out ahead of us. It wasn't like he was going to veer off the road or anything. There was no road, just an endless sea of sand. So it wasn't really that risky. And I was glad he did it, because when Carson smiled, he was ridiculously hot. Like, superstar hot. Like, A-list actor heartthrob hot. Hot. It was a nice distraction when thoughts of my mom threatened to consume me. Carson's eyes were a deep blue, I just wanted to swim in them, and his hair was brown and tousled, like maybe he just got out of bed, or maybe he'd spent 15 minutes arranging it just so. I sighed. Maybe I would never know, but I'd sure like to. His smile became lopsided, and he returned his eyes to the dune we were cresting. The Red Land is what the ancients called the desert. You've never been out here, huh? Unlike most Nezirets, Carson spoke like a real person, not like he'd just walked out of some period movie. I decided I liked that about him, too. Once again, I looked out my window and sighed. It's not like I've got a shot with him anyway. Not now that I'm the psycho traitor woman's daughter. Nope, never been out in the desert before. 
Never been to Egypt before. Never been out of Seattle before. Never had a wanted mom before. I snapped my mouth shut and glanced at him. Why did I have to say that last part? Carson met my eyes for the briefest moment. Seattle, huh? Cool place. I spent the last few years there myself. I perked up a little in my seat, grateful he'd ignored the whole wanted mom slip up. Really? He nodded slowly. Where? I lived in the U District, in a house with some guys. Nezurettes? Yep. Where'd you go to school? I asked, hopeful. If he had been, then it was likely that he wasn't really that much older than me, which would be awesome. Sort of. He flashed me his killer smile again. I was stationed there. To watch Lex? I slumped a little in my seat. Oh, did you, um, go to school somewhere else before that? Oxford, a few years back. I bit my lip, my hopes plummeting. And before that? Oxford was my first, and was just undergrad. Marcus stationed me and the other guys at UW because we were actually interested in grad school. Me specifically because I was able to get into the archaeology program. My eyebrows rose, and I looked at him. So, you worked with Lex. You didn't just watch her. Yep. A small smile touched his lips. We're friends, actually. His smile widened, and he shook his head, laughing softly. <laughs> Last time I saw her, she'd want to bet on who'd get published first. I had to give her a hundred bucks. So, she knows you're a Nezure? Carson shook his head, and his brow creased. She's big on trust, you know, and not lying, since everyone pretty much lied to her forever. Taking a deep breath, he flicked his eyes my way. I know, which is why I asked to be stationed down in Edfu, so she wouldn't have to cross paths with me and feel even more betrayed, especially after what happened at the trial with her friend Kara. He shook his head. Did you hear about all that? I snorted. Are you kidding me? I watched it on the news. I gritted my teeth. I hope someone cuts off that Mike guy's balls. Carson let out a breathy laugh. You and me both, sister. You and me both. At the word sister, my stomach twisted. Wait, you don't mean that literally, do you? I'm pretty sure I do. Mike looks like he could stand to lose a ball or two. I laughed. I almost couldn't believe it, but I really laughed. No, you geek. The sister thing. Seth's not your... My dear old dad? He shook his head. Nah. My dad was a great, 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 great grandson of Marcus's. Was? He nodded. He was gone before I was even born. My fingers clenched around the seatbelt, crossing my shoulder. Was it, was it set? In a way. His hold on the steering wheel tightened, making a creaking noise. Listen, about your mom. Here we go. I understand what it's like to feel betrayed by your parents. I stared at him. You do? I do. He met my eyes, then looked ahead. I really do. After a moment's pause, he said, Just remember that you aren't your mom. You're you. She made a choice for herself, not for you. So don't feel like you have to punish yourself or, I don't know, feel like it's inevitable that you'll follow in her footsteps. Just be your own person. Make your own choices. Make your own choices. Be your own person. I smiled, really liking the sound of that. I took the oath the day before yesterday. Carson's hands tightened on the steering wheel again. Oaths are important, he said, his voice flat, almost distant. A few words can change your life forever. Yeah, I said, returning my gaze to the endless expanse of sandy dunes and feeling a little less lost than I'd been feeling a few minutes earlier. They really can. We reached the oasis late that afternoon, and everyone hopped out of their jeeps and hustled around, 
setting up a city of tents that reminded me of the one I'd lived in for months during the excavation. It sort of felt like coming home, especially the part where everything was sand or rough limestone and just so blah. I thought an oasis was supposed to be like green and lush and stuff. Carson looked around, frowning thoughtfully as we hauled a heavy-duty chest of I don't know what from one of the jeeps and started carrying it toward the center of camp. Legend goes, he said in a woo-woo ghost story voice. It was this crazy crystal city in the middle of the desert, surrounded by enormous walls of limestone. But because it was linked to Nguyen's Ba, when he died, the walls collapsed in on the city and the desert reclaimed it. I gave him a sideways glance. And Dom says I watch too many movies. Chuckling, Carson shrugged. I didn't make up the legend. He squinted conspiratorially. You could always ask one of the ancients for the truth. I've heard some people say that Marcus was even there when Nguyen died. Like, by his side. My eyes widened. Really? Carson shrugged again. I don't know. That's just what I heard. Brow furrowed. I considered his words. Marcus wouldn't tell me anything. I knew that. But if Aset really was his twin sister, then she was just as old as him. I wonder if she was here back then, too. My mouth fell open as I considered another much more chilling possibility. What if Lex was here, is here, back then? Tiny invisible ghost spiders were suddenly crawling all over me. Part 4 Sahara Desert, Lower Egypt, Sixth Dynasty, Old Kingdom Chapter 22. Compare and Contrast. Do you have any idea how much I love you? Heru said in barely intelligible English. It had the sound of something memorized by rote. I grabbed his wrist and stared at him as we continued to walk alongside an ambling line of donkeys packed with the belongings and traveling supplies of nearly two dozen people. What did you just say? Heru met my eyes for a moment, curiosity filling his. Do you have any idea how much I love you? He switched back to the only language we shared, the original tongue. That is what you said to me yesterday, after regaining consciousness, is it not? Yes. How he'd remembered the sounds almost perfectly when he had no idea what they meant, was beyond me. I returned my outward attention to the way ahead, a seemingly endless sea of sand with more swells than I could count, without going cross-eyed. Inside, I was completely focused on a single thought. Please don't ask me what those words mean. What does it mean? I rearranged the white linen wrap draped over my head and around my shoulders, the hood blocked the unrelenting glare fairly well, and the matching robe hung nearly to my ankles, just long enough to protect most of my body from the direct sunlight, without me constantly tripping over the hem. Heru, along with all of the other Nezirets and humans, was wearing a nearly identical garment. I shifted the purring little furnace that was Russ, curled up in his linen sling, to the left side of my body, and stared at the sand a few steps ahead. I would rather not tell you. Heru bumped my shoulder with his arm. Why not, little queen? I didn't need to catch a glimpse of his face to know that he was smiling. Are you so ashamed of your feelings for the great father? Which cut right to the heart of the issue. He thought I'd mistaken him for Nguyen in my delirium. I hadn't. Something like that. I mumbled. So, how far is it to this Netjerat oasis? We were heading into the Sahara on the west side of the Nile, and based on the sun's midday location, I could tell we were heading in a generally west to slightly southwesterly direction. Heru chuckled. 
Very well. I shall let the matter go. We should arrive at the oasis in just over a week. And an ancient Egyptian week was ten days, so closer to two weeks to me. I was not looking forward to ten days of trekking through and camping in the unrelenting desert. Are we absolutely certain we won't run out of water and die of dehydration and have our dried-up husks uncovered by humans in thousands of years? Laughing out loud, Haru assured me of our safety. We've traveled this route thousands of times. After all, the Netgerat Oasis is our home. Wherever else we go, we always return there. Not in my time. I'd never heard of this secret oasis that was apparently the ancient Nejere headquarters, and I was not only bonded to a member of the Council of Seven and the great-granddaughter of the leader of the Council, but I was the Meswet, the prophesied savior of our people and an honorary member of the Council. That alone had made me a leader in my own right, whether I'd wanted to be one or not. It just seemed so odd that I hadn't heard anything about the Netgerat oasis before traveling back for millennia. I heaved a deep, resigned sigh. I doubted I would ever catch up on Nejere trivia, though living out our people's past was turning out to be a good start. What troubles you now, little queen? Our past? Our future? You? I wish you would not call me that. Would you prefer Big Queen? <laughs> no, I laughed. I cannot say that I would. Ah, uh, then you shall forever be Little Queen to me. Blushing for the lamest reason. Haru gave me a nickname. Yippee! I cleared my throat. Why are we returning to the Oasis right now? Is it because of what we saw at the market? How bad things are getting with the drought? In a way, it is many things. Pepe's death, the droughts, and famine. Cassie's inability to help the land any further by continuing to rule the mortals, and the increasing power the Nomarchs are gaining. Mention of the Nomarchs piqued my interest. They were the regional governors of ancient Egypt's 20-plus different gnomes, or territories, yet another theory in my time claimed that the slow transfer of power from the pharaoh to the regional leaders during Pepi II's reign was what had led to the demise of the old kingdom. A shift of power on top of droughts and famine sounded like a perfect recipe for revolution to me. Has there been much unrest? We thought, I shook my head, rephrasing what I'd been about to say. We thought the downfall of the Sixth Dynasty was caused by, was hardly an appropriate way to talk to someone who was currently living in the Sixth Dynasty. In my homeland, we heard rumors of rebellions and regional leaders gaining power, but we were unsure how much truth there was to those rumors. You heard correctly. Heru's linen cowl flapped as he shook his head. Had Kessie taken care of this latest peppy, as she was supposed to do, this all might have been a little more manageable, but... But what? What do you mean, taken care of? He lived until he was in his nineties. I shrugged. That seems pretty taken care of to me. She led him on too well, and he loved her too much. Heru laughed, but it was a bitter sound. He refused to lay with any of his other wives, and for whatever reason, Cassie manipulated the art, hiding for some seventy years the fact that none of the few children born to his wives had been fathered by him, possibly because she fed on his adoration for her. She should have told us of his refusal and sent him on to the next life, so a ruler with the will to produce an heir could be appointed. But, he took a deep breath, exhaling a tired sigh, she did not. And Pepe spent the last twenty-five years of his life, more or less an invalid with Cassie ruling in his stead. And now, 
Not one of the bastard children born to his wives survives. He shook his head slowly. I still do not understand why she would do such a thing. Risk the people of this land so recklessly. He shook his head. Nguyen was not pleased, as you can imagine. But she is his daughter, and he has long favored her. I think she was afraid, I said, hoping my words were quiet enough that the woman in question wouldn't overhear me. I was pretty sure she was somewhere up ahead, but with a desert cowls, everyone looked alike from the back. Catching my reluctance to speak at full volume, Heru moved closer and leaned down so his head was nearer to mine. Please, explain what you mean, he said softly. I hesitated, unsure how open I could really be with Heru regarding Angus and Pepe. She seems like a woman who would do anything for power. And I would bet that losing power is her greatest fear, along with the reason she dislikes me so much. Heru made a rough noise low in his throat. That and her misperception of our relationship. Right. But I think you may be correct, he said. She is devious and conniving, and would likely trade anything short of her life to be in your position, the Netgerat queen. Even as Nguyen's eldest daughter, she has never been considered such. I was shaking my head in disbelief, and the words were out before I even knew what I was saying. If you think so poorly of her, then why do you... I snapped my mouth shut. Why do I? Nothing. I stared at the rear end of one of the donkeys up ahead. Forget I said anything. If that is what you truly desire. I was standing in a shallow valley of sand, surrounded on all sides by rounded dunes. The sky overhead was red and orange, and I thought this might be what it would be like to stand on the surface of Mars. Heru and I had both stripped off our desert cowls once the sun set, starting its nightly trip through the underworld. And now stood barefoot in the sand, facing each other. Heru was wearing nothing but his usual linen kilt, and I had on a decidedly thin slip of a dress. The yellows, oranges, and reds, bleeding across the sky, set Heru's skin aglow, and his golden irises ablaze. He was stunning, and more than a little distracting, with all of that skin and muscle and... Hit me, Heru said. What? My eyes widened, and I took a step backward. No. Heru exhaled heavily, a sound that could be mistaken for nothing other than annoyance. Hit me. I shook my head. I will not. I might hurt you. I fully understood that Heru training me to be less of a defenseless wimp would require me to actually practice defending myself against other people him, for starters. But I just couldn't bring myself to actually hit him. Heru laughed, the sound low and velvety. Trust me, you could not possibly hurt me. Taking a step closer, I gave him a chummy punch on the shoulder. It was pathetic, even more so because it wasn't like I was incapable of hitting him. I'd done it before. Once, I'd slapped him, but I'd been seething with anger. And, damn it, he deserved it. He'd abandoned me in a compound filled with Nezurettes during the scariest, most confusing time of my life. Other than now, which was decidedly scarier and more confusing. But this wasn't Heru's fault. I had no desire to hit him. You stare harder than you hit, he said, settling a level gaze on me. You stare harder than you hit, I repeated in a snotty, sing-song voice. I do not want to hurt you. I held up a hand, stopping him before he could reiterate how impossible it was for me to hurt his mightiness. Regardless of whether I even could, why would I try if I had no desire to cause you pain? Heru studied me, pursing his lips, the faintest amount and narrowing his eyes. 
The protracted moment of silence started to grow uncomfortable, and he crossed his arms. If I asked Cassie to hit me, she would do it. Could do it. Jealousy and rage flared to life, intense and uncontrollable. I acted on pure instinct. Clenching my jaw, I pulled my arm back and swung. My palm struck the side of his chiseled face with a smack, stinging instantly. Ow, I said, shaking out my hand. Heru was grinning, his eyes shining. It would seem that you found sufficient motivation to want to hurt me. I mirrored him, crossing my arms over my chest, and started digging the toes of one bare foot into the sand. If I promise to try to beat you senseless, will you promise to never compare me to her again? So, I would not be allowed to say that she is shorter than you? I smiled, just a little. Heru? Or that her feet are much more masculine than yours? I couldn't help but laugh. I relaxed my arms at my sides. You are making fun of me. Clearly, those comparisons are not driving you to fulfill your promise to try to beat me senseless. He grinned wickedly. Until you show me that you intend to fulfill your side of the bargain, I see no need to fulfill mine. He tilted his head downward, tucking his chin closer to his neck and watching me with a dangerous glint in his eyes. The curve of Kessie's hips is enough to make a man. Stop, Heru, I said, my voice low and even. Want to take hold of her and be quiet, I shouted, slapping my hands over my ears. The dangerous glint in his eyes intensified. Make me. I shivered, partially from the rapidly cooling evening air and partially from the challenge issued by every inch of his body. Glaring, I stepped closer, stopping when I was only inches away from him and had to tilt my head back to meet his eyes. He raised one eyebrow. As intimidating as your very presence is. Staring into those golden pools, I slammed the heels of my hands into his abdomen. I skittered away as he doubled over, momentarily breathless, then lunged at him, leaping onto his back, wrapping my legs around his middle and hooking my feet together. I snaked my right arm around his neck, squeezing in what I hoped was an effective chokehold. Not that I had any clue how such a thing was actually done, and brought my lips to his ear. How am I doing? Apparently not that well, because Heru straightened and peeled my arm away from his neck with little effort. Luckily, my other arm was hooked over his shoulder, my fingers clutching one very well-formed pectoral. So I managed to stay on his back. Besides, I wasn't going anywhere with the death grip my legs had around his hips. In fact, I only had to scoot a few inches lower for my heels to dig into his... You would not dare, Heru said between heavy breaths, and I gave myself a mental pat on the back for making him breathe so hard. I would not. I continued my slow slide down his body. Heru dropped to his knees and leaned back until I was sandwiched between him and the hot sand. The weight of him was enough to steal my breath, and I was certain he wasn't even trying to hurt me. If he had been, he would have slammed me backward into the sand while he'd still been standing, rather than slowly lowering us to the ground. No, he just really didn't want me shoving my heel into his tender man parts. I unhooked my feet and slapped his chest with both hands. You win. Heru rolled off me and crouched on his knees beside me, helping me up to a sitting position while I coughed and gasped for air. He even tugged down the skirt of my shift for me. I believe we have come to an agreement, he said, meeting my eyes. If you continue to show that much enthusiasm when I am training you to defend yourself, I will refrain from even mentioning her. Deal. I held out my hand to shake on it. When he didn't show any sign of extending his own, 
I grabbed his wrist and guided his hand to mine. Gripping his tightly, I shook for both of us. Heru looked down at our joined hands, then met my eyes, his expression bewildered. It is a custom from my land. We shake hands when we have come to an agreement. Heru's smile was slow to come, but it grew to something radiant. He tightened his grip and shook back. We have an agreement, he said with a nod. His smile faltered. How long is this custom supposed to go on? I laughed. Only a few seconds. Ah, I see. He stood, easily pulling me up to stand in front of him. And now, little queen, I will teach you how to focus your excessive enthusiasm so you may have a chance to hurt me. Chapter 23 Pain and Gain Asset and I walked arm in arm alongside the caravan of burdened donkeys. Heru, my ever-present sentinel, following several paces behind us. All three of us were bedecked in our linen desert robes and cowls, as was everyone else, making us look like a procession of overheated, sweaty Halloween ghosts. It was our fourth day on the hot, dry trek through the Sahara toward the Netjerat oasis, and I was fairly certain I had sand pretty much everywhere. The ceaseless hours of hand-to-hand -hand defense lessons Hera required every night ensured that, as did the literal hole-in-the-sand latrines. Asset glanced over her shoulder at her brother, then leaned closer to me. He is taking this task of watching over you very seriously, is he not? She whispered. There was a suggestive twinkle in her eyes. Trust me, Asset, nothing like that has happened. I told her, just as quietly, keeping my eye on Harrow's expression to gauge whether or not he could hear what we were saying. And nothing like that can happen. I suppose. A wistful sigh escaped from her. But you are feeling better, with the withdrawals, yes? I nodded. She was quiet for a moment. You could still tell him about the two of you in the future, no? Even if you do not act on your feelings. He does not even know that I am from the future. I really do not think. Asset tutted me. You will have to block everyone's memories of you when you depart anyway. Everyone's except yours and Nikure's, I thought, which she was perfectly aware of. So why not at least be honest with him? He will not remember until your time, and you will feel less burdened in this time. I chewed the inside of my cheek. I'm afraid. Of? I sighed. I fear he will think I am insane, and that I will drive him away. If you had told him when you first arrived, perhaps, but he knows you now, and he knows that you are a little different. She paused. I think you should tell him. I sighed. What does Nguyen think? Glancing back at Heru, I found his eyes on me. I offered him a quick smile, then leaned closer to Asad. He agrees. Or, at least when I first arrived, he agreed that I should not tell Heru. That he found the idea of bonding, of being tied to someone so completely, distasteful. And that telling him we were bondmates in the future would only make him avoid me but we have not spoken of it since then. In fact, we have not spoken much at all. I exhaled in exasperation and shook my head. Maybe I should tell him. Maybe I shouldn't. I just don't know. An almost electric thrill washed over me, and I stumbled. Only my link with Asset's arm kept me on my feet. She halted beside me as what felt like a burst of lightning pulsed in my chest and I doubled over. Lex? Asset's voice sounded panicked. Lex? Heru! But there was no need for her to call to him. He was already there, right behind me, one arm wrapped around my shoulders and crossing my chest, the other clutching my waist. Were it not for him, 
I would have collapsed onto my hands and knees. What is it? Heru said, his breath brushing my cheek. Is this the same ailment as before? I clutched his forearm. No, I breathed. This felt nothing like bonding withdrawals. This felt so much worse. I looked at Aset, who was standing in front of me, her awestruck face mere inches from mine. Your eyes, they are... Another burst of electric power exploded from my chest, and the agony reached all the way to my fingertips and toes. Smoky wisps of every shade of red, orange, and yellow pulsed from the exposed skin on my hands. I was betting the same was visible on my face. Get Nguyen, I managed to say through gritted teeth. Asat nodded her face ashen. She turned and sprinted away, tripping over her robe only once. I groaned under the sheer force of the next wave of power. My breaths were quick and shallow, and I could hear others around me, some murmuring, some shouting. Russ, bundled in his linen sling, yowled and dug his needle-like claws into my chest. I somehow managed to dig him out from under the layers of linen and hand him off to the nearest person. Deny, I thought. Hero, I gasped. Get me away from everyone. They cannot see this. They cannot see what I am. If a pep is riding along inside one of them. Hero didn't hesitate in scooping me up, cradling me in his arms. He broke into a run, calling over his shoulder that only Nguyen, Set, Nukure, and Aset were allowed to follow. Adding in a warning, that he would personally eviscerate any others who dared to defy him. He sprinted over a low dune, then around a taller one, skidding several times on the descent but never coming close to dropping me. When we reached a deep valley between several sand dunes, he fell to his knees, still cradling me. He was looking at my face, into my eyes, when the next wave of power broke free. His lips parted as he stared at me, wonder altering his every feature. For seconds, or maybe minutes, we stared into each other's eyes. Thank you, Heru, but you have to release her now, Nguyen said, his voice calm and sure. Heru tightened his hold on me. No. Alexandra, can you hear me? I could feel the pressure building again, and I whimpered. Heru, you must release her and return to the others. Heru's eyes finally left mine, and the look he turned on Nguyen was filled with defiance. Go, oh, I whispered, squeezing my eyes shut. It was about to happen again, and this time I was certain it would be way more than a burst of power. This was going to be an explosion, and I feared it would tear apart anything near me. I feared it would tear me apart, Go, I howled, my voice filled with desperation, with agony, with power. Go! Heru finally heeded my demand, handing me over to Nguyen. Go, I repeated. Go, go, go! He is gone, dear Alexandra. It is just the two of us now. Nguyen's voice was soothing. He will make it better. He will make me better. I was so sure. I'm going to remove the shield, and we will both be surrounded by the outpouring of excess power for a short time. But the shoot will expend itself, and you will be okay again. He hugged me against him, and I realized I was crying, sobbing. The force of the convulsions racking my body was making him shake as well. Unable to respond with words, I nodded. All right, child. Just breathe. Nguyen's voice resonated with power. Breathe. I had no choice but to follow his command. He pressed his lips to my forehead, pulling down the block. And I screamed. I felt like I'd been lit on fire. The desert and clear blue afternoon sky disappeared, and in their stead, our own private Aurora Borealis burst into life, 
countless rainbow tendrils snaking around us. They were alive. They were feeding off me, consuming me. Again, I screamed, and it was the sound of a soul dying. With a whoosh, the colors retracted, imploding until they once again fit snugly inside me. Breathe, my Alexandra, Nguyen told me, a hint of strain marbling his calm tone. Breathe. I sucked in a breath of air. Good. Again, breathe. Good girl. What the hell was that? I asked between gasping breaths. That, Nguyen said, raising his eyebrows, was entirely my fault. I closed my eyes and focused on taking long, steady breaths. Meaning? Meaning it's time for us to start your training in earnest. Chapter 24 Oath-Bound and Awestruck If Herod had his way, he would have carried me like a helpless baby the final few hours of the afternoon's journey. I was starting to think Heru would prefer to just stick me under his arm and cart me around in general, if only to keep me out of harm's way, though he may have had a point on this one occasion. Once I convinced him to put me down, about fifteen minutes after the caravan had resumed its slow but steady parade across the desert, I proceeded to stumble and trip over basically nothing for the next fifteen minutes. I was bone-weary, but at least it was a weariness that wore off fairly quickly. By the time we made camp beside an enormous, rocky outcropping, I felt more or less normal, if a little jittery. Not even the wary glances sent my way were overly bothersome. Nothing seemed unsettling in comparison to Heru's silence all afternoon. He stayed by my side, ready to reach out and steady me if I needed him. But he said nothing, and every time I met his eyes, I saw questions and fear, and worst of all, accusation. What is wrong with her? He asked as we approached Nguyen who was standing with Set at the very edge of camp. Nguyen didn't answer. He simply looked past us, nodded at someone behind us, and started walking along the perimeter of the outcropping, away from camp. Come with me. Heru, Set, and I exchanged a confused look. I shrugged, then started after Nguyen, and Heru and Set had little choice but to follow. Hearing footsteps crunching in the rock-strewn sand behind us, I looked over my shoulder. Nakure was trotting to catch up. Nguyen led us around a jutting cliffside, up a narrow path that passed between the face of the cliff and a huge natural monolith, and finally, toward an uneven break in the cliff's wall. I picked up my pace to catch up to him, but Heru caught my wrist. When I looked over my shoulder, meeting his eyes, my breath hitched, because I knew the man he would one day become so well. I knew what those desperate golden eyes were asking. Will you stay where I can see you? Will you let me protect you? Will you let me know your secrets? Will you let me know you? Will you trust me? I stopped trying to pull my wrist free of his grasp. I would tell you everything, Heru. I really would, if I thought you would believe me. He simply stared down at me his eyes demanding answers I wasn't willing to give him. I touched my free hand to the one he'd wrapped around my wrist, pushing it lower so our fingers could link together. I have a feeling that what you are about to see is going to give you some of the answers you seek. I continued on to the opening in the cliff's wall. Heru, right behind me, our fingers were still linked. He squeezed my hand when I pulled too far ahead, and again... I looked back at him. Nejerat, we pretend to be gods, he said, stopping just before the opening. We pretend to be gods, but... I turned to face him. Are you a true Nejer, a true goddess? I smiled, laughing softly, and raised my hand to trail my fingertips down the side of his face, 
His stubble felt rough and a little sweat dampened. Sometimes I still feel like a regular old human, and other times I feel like a young Nezuret who is drowning in events and powers that are so far beyond her comprehension. I sighed, but most of the time I simply feel lost. I honestly do not know what I am anymore. Heru's jaw tensed under my fingertips, but those liquid gold eyes softened. I see you. I know what you are. A half-hearted laugh bubbled in my chest. And what is that? He smiled, and my soul sang. My little queen. He lowered himself to his knees and gazed up at me, those eyes no longer warm, but hard and determined. I live to serve Alexandra. My life is yours, Alexandra. May you live forever. I stared down at him, dumbfounded. He'd attempted to pledge an oath to me once before, and I denied him. And now, though he'd spoken in a completely different language, the words were essentially the same. Tears welled in my eyes. It was so hard to treat him like he was a different person from Marcus when he did things like this, proving that he truly was the same man. A smile touched my lips as the tears broke free. I placed my hands on his shoulders, sliding them up his neck until they were on either side of his head. I would rather have your friendship than your obedience, my Haru, because this Haru was my Haru as much as Marcus was. You have both, he said, his voice rough. My heart seemed to clench, and the tears only increased. Catching movement out of the corner of my eye, I glanced away from Heru. Set and Nakure were hanging back near an outcropping in the cliff's face, giving us privacy. Heru stood, and my hand slid down the front of his body. I closed my eyes, enjoying this single, lone chance to feel that soft skin, that hard muscle beneath my fingertips. His hands were on my face, his thumbs wiping away my tears, and I so desperately wanted to lean into him, to kiss him, to feel his soul merge with mine, which would kill him. I opened my eyes and pulled my hands away from his abdomen, clearing my throat. I took a step backward. I shall test your claim right now, then. He stared at me, his face unreadable. I held an arm out toward the opening in the cliff's wall. Please, join Nguyen. I just need a moment to collect myself, and then I will join you. His face hardened into a recognizable expression. Defiance. I would prefer not to leave you alone out here. I offered him a weak smile. It was the best I could do. I will not be alone. I nodded at Set and Nakure, who were heading toward us. Heru hesitated, but after a few heartbeats, he stepped around me. A few seconds later, he was gone from my sight. I sat on a small boulder, waiting for the urge to cry to pass and wiping the remainder of my tears from my cheeks. You have made a mess of your call, Set said in his broken English as he neared. Nakure passed me heading through the break in the rock wall, but Set hung back. I laughed dryly. What I wouldn't give for some waterproof coal. A product available in your time? Something like that. Set crouched in front of me and tore a small piece of linen from the hem of his kilt. I offer to help. He raised the cloth, bringing it close to my face. If you will allow me to. I smiled and nodded and he touched the cloth to the skin under my eyes, wiping gently. Unlike Heru, whose two identities had now merged in my mind, a dangerous reality, I saw this set and the one from my time as two distinctly separate people. This set was kind, generous, and exceptionally thoughtful, none of which were words anyone would use to describe a pep set. I have a question for you as well, and hope you will give an honest answer. I licked my lips and swallowed. Ask away. I'm all ears. All ears, he laughed. Your language has such strange sayings. I grinned. 
I think every language has strange sayings. This is truth. So what did you want to ask me? Set hesitated, frowning the slightest amount. When first we meet, you had fear in your eyes. Fear of me. He was quiet for a moment as he continued to wipe the tear-smudged coal off my face. I have hurt you in your time, I think. Is this truth? It was my turn to hesitate. But considering that I was going to wipe his mind of all memory of me when I left this ancient time, I figured I might as well tell him at least some of our shared history. I captured his wrist and pulled his hand lower, holding it in both of mine. Looking into his warm, coffee-brown eyes, I said, Yes, Set, you did hurt me. At his crestfallen look, I added, But you didn't have a choice, and it wasn't your fault. I know this now. I do not understand. His brow furrowed, and he shook his head. Why would I do such a thing? I shrugged. It's complicated. We are... Related in some way, no? I blinked, and my mouth fell open. Why, what makes you think that? He smiled, just a little. The resemblance is impossible to miss, I think. Aset and Nekure have commented on this to me as well. Well, they didn't say anything to me. I cleared my throat. Um, yeah, we're related. A pregnant silence hung between us, waiting, expanding. Are you my daughter? A breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding whooshed out of my lungs, and I closed my eyes. I nodded. Suddenly, his arms were around me, and I was sobbing, and I didn't understand why. Set rubbed my back as I clung to him. I am here, my daughter. I am here. By the time Set and I made it through the break in the cliff's wall and into a wide cavern lit by periodic cracks in the stone overhead, my eyes were dry and my makeup was as tidy as it could have been after the repeated waterworks. The floor was soft sand, cool through the bottoms of my leather moccasins. But overhead, the ceiling was dripping with stalactites, some long enough that I had to be careful as I walked around to avoid bonking my head. Nguyen, Heru, and Nakure were standing in the relative center of the space, speaking in hushed tones. Come, dear Alexandra, Nguyen said, holding his hand out to me. I approached him. What are we doing in here? Oh, he who loves mystery above all things. Nakure made a choking noise, and I glanced at him. He was trying not to smile. Nguyen narrowed his eyes, but I thought I spotted a tiny sparkle of amusement. He looked at the three Nezherets, who were standing side by side. As you witnessed today, Alexandra is not merely Nezherat. Nakure and Set already knew what Nguyen was sharing, but Heru didn't. I focused on Heru's face as Nguyen spoke. His eyes, too, stayed locked on mine. Just as I am not merely Netjerat, but my time in this body is coming to an end, and it was essential that I pass on my power, my shoot, to another. I chose Alexandra as the recipient because it is what had to be. He paused for a moment, and I thought he must have been considering what other half-truths to share. But... Alexandra is still physically Netjerat, and as such, her body is not able to fully handle the power I have given her, just as no other Netjerat would be able to do. She must learn to control it and regularly expend it, so it does not overwhelm her and, quite literally, explode out of her, as it did today. Doing so will extend the time she has to complete the tasks she is destined for before the shoot destroys her completely. Heru's eyes snapped to Nguyen, and his entire body went rigid. Destroys her. Nguyen laughed softly. I tell you that my own life is coming to an end and you say nothing, 
But I mentioned that Alexandra is in danger and you react quite differently. He grinned. This pleases me. It makes me think that you must be taking very good care of my beloved wife. I stared at Nguyen. My eyes narrowed. I hadn't the slightest clue why he would say something like that, and say it teasingly, not accusingly. It was almost like he wanted Haro and me to have a physical relationship, which he knew was impossible. Haru clenched his jaw. I would never dishonor either you or her in such a way. Nguyen made a noncommittal noise, and I was pretty sure he winked at me. Cheeks flaming, I shook my head and forced myself not to look at Haru. I had no clue what Nguyen was thinking. Did he want me to doom the timeline by bonding with and killing Haru? Now, dear Alexandra, Nguyen said, I will teach you how to stop time and to jump from place to place at will. And tonight, I will teach you how to use some of your more subtle mental abilities. He touched my forehead, and based on the sudden widening of the three Nezirets' eyes, I was betting that my own eyes were on fire with power. I looked at Nguyen, waiting for instructions. Sit, he said, pointing to the cavern wall on my left. Go, stand over there. He turned his attention to Heru and pointed to the opposite wall. Over here, Heru. Nikure he directed to the cavern opening. All three moved quickly, and once they were standing in their assigned spots facing us, Nguyen smiled at me. Go to Heru. The corners of my mouth tensed as I took my first step toward Heru, and when Nguyen grabbed my arm holding me back, I frowned. What? Still smiling, Nguyen shook his head. Using this shoot, go to Heru. I took a deep breath. I have never been able to control it at will. It only happens when I feel a strong emotion and need to be somewhere. Very well. Nguyen moved so swiftly I didn't realize what he was doing until the crystalline dagger was already flying through the air toward Heru. No! I shouted. Time stopped, and misty tendrils of color surrounded me. One moment I was standing beside Nguyen. The next, I was in front of Heru, staring at the dagger. It was a beautiful piece of craftsmanship, clearly made of ot, and its point was barely a foot from Heru's shocked face. I shot Nguyen's frozen form a scathing glare, then wrapped my fingers around the dagger's hilt, thinking it would be so easy if the thing would just cease to be. My fingers started sinking into the hilt, and I watched, amazed, as the entire dagger reverted to its original state, a liquid hunk of quicksilver goop. I released it, and it dissolved into a colorful mist and was gone. Wow. Heru's arm was suddenly swinging through the air, and I barely had time to duck before his attempt to swat the no longer existing dagger away struck me instead. Crap, I hissed as I fell back on my butt. At least the sand was soft. It took Heru several seconds to process what had just happened. As his eyes settled on me, sprawled on the ground, they widened, his lips parting. How you were there, he pointed in Nguyen's general direction. But now you are here, and the dagger. I tossed another glare at Nguyen over my shoulder, and when I looked back at Heru, he was kneeling on the sand before me. Are you all right? he asked. All but my pride. I accepted his hand and stood, brushing off my backside and shooting several more glares Nguyen's way. Heru stared at me, his eyes filled with awe. It is true. You are a goddess. For the moment, yes. That term is very appropriate for her, Nguyen said. Very good, Alexandra. Now, jump to set. I let go of Heru's hand, and planting my hands on my hips turned to face Nguyen. Are you going to throw a knife at him, too? Nguyen grinned. Only if I must. 
Once you are able to use the power at will, I will not have need of such motivations. As it turned out, he had three more art knives secreted away in his kilt. He only had to use two. Chapter 25 Revelations and Reservations I was exhausted by the time Nguyen said I was finished practicing spatial shifts. Each successive jump took more concentration, and the lag time between jumps increased steadily, until Heru, Set, and Nikure had to steady me with sure hands when I appeared before each of them. Only when I lost consciousness for a few seconds, awakening with Heru's arms holding my slumped body tightly against him, did Nguyen relent. Was it really necessary to push her so far? Heru said. I patted his sides. I am all right, I can stand. He helped me get my feet securely under me and released all but my elbow, which he held onto with a firm grip. I was grateful. I wasn't sure I could balance on my own. Turning away from Heru, I watched Set approach Nguyen. Surely you did not need to make Alexandra... Nguyen cut him off with a hard look. I am doing what is necessary to keep her alive. To prolong her life, you mean, Set countered. Clasping his hands in front of him, Nguyen took a deep breath, giving off an aura of placid unconcern. Until she may complete her tasks, yes. I exhaled heavily. Nguyen... How am I supposed to complete these tasks if I don't even know how I'm supposed to complete them? Nguyen stared at me for a long time, his expression turning considering. Finally, he nodded. I will tell you part of what the future must hold for you. I had intended to save this information until the final moments before you departed, to avoid complicating things for you here, you see, but... He shook his head serenely. I suppose I do not see harm in it. His eyes flicked to Heru, then settled back on me. And considering the unexpected restraint you have been showing, I think only good will come of telling you now, dear Alexandra. So I shall. In private. He glanced at Heru, Sat, and Akure. You may return to camp. Haru released my elbow, lingering near me for a few seconds, probably to make sure I wasn't about to collapse. I wasn't. I already felt notably steadier. At the sound of his retreating footsteps, I had to force myself not to turn around and follow him. Nguyen held his hand out to me. Come, my Alexandra, sit with me. I approached, keeping a watchful eye on him and accepted his hand when I reached him. It was finally starting to sink in that my knowledge of this man, this god, barely scratched the surface. Proceeding with caution seemed like a really good idea at the moment. With a sigh, Nguyen drew me down to the sand. He sat cross-legged, and I knelt on the ground in front of him. He studied me with somber eyes their swirling colors appearing a little duller than usual. I've relied on the knowledge I gain from the art for far too long, he said in English, and it would seem that I no longer have a knack for doing things the old-fashioned way. Doing things? Yes, you know, living, making decisions, confiding in others. Frowning, I shook my head. So, what are you saying? I assumed that certain personal matters would progress differently, naturally, and far more quickly than they have. But my assumption was clearly false, he said with another sigh. And now I see that I am at fault, because I have not been open enough with you. Dear Alexandra. Personal matters. Are you talking about Harry with me? Nguyen nodded. Your connection to each other is quite 
strong, and it grows stronger every day. I assumed your relationship would have developed into something more physical at this point, considering... Again, I was shaking my head. But we... I... We can't have a physical relationship. If I bond with Haru and then... I snapped my fingers. Poof. I'm gone. He's dead. Nguyen narrowed his eyes, and his lips curved into a secretive smile. Ah, and now I see where I have erred. I thought I'd explained something far better than I had. Laughing quietly, he shook his head. If you and Heru bond in this time, he won't die when you leave. But... Because you will save him. I searched Nguyen's face, his mesmerizing eyes, trying to understand. But... How? By extracting a bunch of my bonding pheromones for him to keep until we meet in 4,000 years? No, dear Alexandra. You could not extract enough to last so long. No, I am speaking of a different matter entirely. Don't you recall my mentioning that you could use the shoot within you to create a block within another that would forestall withdrawal symptoms indefinitely? I blinked several times, searching my memory, then slapped my palm to my forehead. I felt like such a blind, bumbling idiot. You said I couldn't create something like that within me, but you never said I couldn't create a block for Haru. I laughed out loud, not quite ready to let myself believe that bonding with Haru in this time was really possible. I can't believe I didn't understand what you meant. Nguyen smiled broadly, but his expression quickly sobered. There is one caveat that you must be very conscientious of. I raised my eyebrows. Once the block is in place, the next time you and Heru have intimate contact. Define intimate contact. Nguyen laughed softly. Sexual intercourse, Alexandra. My eyes widened, but I nodded for him to continue. The moment the two of you achieve a fully realized union of your two bars, the block will be shattered, and Heru will once again be subject to the regular onset of bonding withdrawals, should the two of you be separated again, and the block not be reset again. I chewed on the inside of my cheek. But it could be reset again. I mean, right? Nguyen nodded. As many times as is necessary. So, it's really possible? Heru and I can really be us? Nguyen nodded and clasped his fingers together, resting his hands on his ankles. In fact... I believe it may be essential that the two of you truly be together during your time here. I tilted my head to the side. Essential? To what? To your survival, dear Alexandra. You see, the only way to purge the shoot from your body and have you survive is for it to be naturally siphoned into another being. Binding with another ba within you. My brow furrowed. Huh? Nguyen smiled. Once you have returned to your time, you must bear a child. My mouth fell open. Two, in fact. One to bind with the shoot within you, and one to bind with the shoot within the heru of your time. What? I was shaking my head and staring at him with widened eyes. But, but I can't. It's not physically possible. But it is physically possible. I snapped my mouth shut. Bonding has many side effects. One being the increased dependency between the bondmates on each other's bonding pheromones. Another being 
the triggering of a rare, dormant fertility hormone in the Nijarate's body. Once activated, this fertility hormone suppresses the Nijarate's regenerative abilities for the duration of the pregnancy. He paused, then explained, Only once the Nijarate's system is saturated with enough of the combined bonding pheromones of both bondmates will the fertility hormone be triggered, regeneration suppressed, and successful conception a possibility. He smirked, which is why it is my belief that you and Heru must achieve a physical relationship in this time. It will take much more intimate contact between the two of you to exchange enough bonding pheromones for your body to reach that critical saturation point. I'd started shaking my head again and forced myself to stop. Taking deep breaths, I released my skirt and pressed my hands against my knees, trying to make Nguyen's words make sense. He reached out and touched the back of my hand. And when your body finally does reach the critical saturation point and the fertility hormone is triggered, both apeps shoot, assuming it's whole within Heru, and the shoot within you will naturally gravitate toward the newly forming ba within your uterus, safely separating from your own ba and Heru's, and the two shoots will carry this new ba, and therefore the embryo, to divide into two separate beings, and you will carry twins. Nguyen smiled, and his face lit up with so much wonder and glory that some of it should have spilled into me. It didn't. Twins, I breathed. He nodded. And they will be more than human. More than Nijere. Twins, I cleared my throat. Like, two of them? At once? Nguyen chuckled. Yes, my Alexandra, and, as I said, it will take a while to reach the critical saturation point, so if you want your body to be anywhere near close to that point, by the time you return to your own time, I'd highly suggest that you, how do you say it? He squinted thoughtfully. Ah, yes, clear the air with Heru. And soon, lest you run out of time before the shoot destroys you. I swallowed roughly. Suddenly, my heart rate sped up as I realized that if I wanted to be with Heru in this time, if I wanted to prevent my own impending death, I would have to tell him everything. Chapter 26 Will and Won't I rushed back to camp, Nguyen a short ways behind me. I was practicing some pretty impressive repression skills. Of all that Nguyen had just revealed, only a single thing had truly sunk in. If I bonded with Heru in this time, bonding withdrawals wouldn't kill him when I left. We could have this much more time together. I could really share part of Marcus's ancient past with him, and when I returned to my own time, I could unblock his memories of us, now, and together, we could revel in the experiences we shared millennia ago. And we're going to have children. Twins. Nope. I definitely wasn't ready to deal with that little revelation yet. Absolutely, definitely not. I was ready to think about anything but that. What I needed was to find Heru. I was resolved to finally tell him the truth, to finally confess everything about where I came from, who I was, and who he was to me. His tent was my first stop, closely followed by the one I shared with Denai and the other two priestesses who'd chosen to accompany me to the oasis, which was sandwiched between Heru's and Nguyen's tents. Both were empty, so I wandered from tiny cook fire to tiny cook fire. There were only three of them, 
each manned by cooks under Henny's guidance. But Heru wasn't posted around any of them. Frustrated, I headed for the edge of camp, intending to walk a circle around the perimeter to see if I could spot him among the limestone cliffs and sand dunes surrounding us. But I didn't spot him. I heard him. His voice lured me in, harsh and clipped. And though I couldn't understand his words, I could hear how impassioned he was. I followed the sound toward a lopsided monolith near the rock outcropping. And when I saw him, with her, on the other side of the monolith, I froze. Ancus and Pepe's back was to the tall stone, and Heru's body was flush against hers, his hand gripping her neck and his face mere inches from hers. I wanted to scream, to shout for him to release her, to will her into non-existence. I needed, with every fiber of my being, to warn her off him, to claim him, just as I'd done in my own time but this wasn't my own time. I clenched my hands into fists, my nails digging into my palms, and I kept just this side of losing control. A desert wind picked up around me, gusting in their direction. Heru snapped his head my way, and suddenly I was a deer in his eyes were headlights, and I had to run to escape if I was going to have any chance of surviving some imminent collision. I spun around, and hurtled toward the nearest possible safe haven, the huge rock outcropping. No thought for the wind whipping through my hair or snapping the fabric of my dress. I wasn't a slow runner, but Heru was faster. If Nguyen hadn't reset the block cutting off my access to his chute, I could have jumped to any place I desired, but he had reset the block, and I was just me. Lex, Nejarette, and... All I could do was run. I made it a few hundred yards, out of sight of camp and the monolith I now wanted to demolish, because to my mind, it would forever carry the impression of his body pressed against hers. Heru's hand curled around my arm, gripping it tightly, and he jerked me to a halt. He stepped in front of me, his face hard and tense, and very clearly livid. What were you thinking, running away on your own like that? Where would you go? What? I slammed my palm into his abdomen, just under his ribs, like he taught me to do if I wanted to knock my opponent temporarily breathless. Twisting my arm, I yanked it out of his grasp and sprinted away. The wind was roaring in my ears. Alexandra! Heru shouted, but I ignored him, immersing myself in the howling of the wind in the abrasion of sand against my skin. I ran as fast and as hard as I could along the rock wall, staring down at the sand and focusing on putting one foot in front of the other. An arm hooked around my waist, and my back slammed against a hot, hard body, and I was suddenly having a really hard time inhaling anything but sand. I was dragged closer to the rock wall, and then there was only stone and darkness met by a jagged sliver of muddled light and what appeared to be a living wall of sand. I'd run straight into a sandstorm. Are you all right? Heru asked, his voice harsh, like it had been when he'd been with her only moments ago. I elbowed him in the abdomen, and he released me. Not that I had anywhere to go. We were standing in a crevice in the cliff's wall, wide and deep enough for maybe four people, and there was a sandstorm screaming just beyond the opening, only a few feet in front of me. Did you get sand in your eyes? Scrubbing my hands over my unscathed face, I shook my head and turned to him. I had no choice but to remain mere inches away from him. I did not realize there was a storm. I looked down, avoiding his shadowed features and feeling like I'd just earned the grand prize for world's most moronic Nejarette. Thank you for pulling me in here. He made a rough, dismissive noise. Why did you run away? I clenched my jaw. I would think it obvious at this point. I listened as he inhaled and exhaled several times. 
When he finally spoke, his voice was quiet, just audible over the howling storm behind me. What we both want, Alexandra, that can never be. You are wife to the great father. I squeezed my eyes shut. Here goes. Only in name. Several more breaths. What are you saying? I sighed. Nguyen and I will never be a true husband and wife. We will never have a true marriage. I paused, working up the nerve to tell him about us. Nguyen and I will never have that because I am already attached to another. Behind me, the wind howled, but it was nowhere near as intense as the lightning storm standing before me. I took a deep breath. Haru? Nguyen named me his wife to protect me while I'm here. Now. I am not from this time, and my true husband waits for me in my own time. Heru shook his head, his features too shadowed for me to make out his expression clearly. I do not understand. Such a thing is not possible. You saw me jump from one place to another a little while ago. You saw the power I carry explode out of me. How is this any less believable? Again, he shook his head. It is not. I huffed out a breath. Just as the power Nguyen gave me enables me to shift through space, I can do the same through time. I pressed a hand against Heru's chest, stopping his unvoiced questions or any further protestations. You have seen me manipulate time already. When Nguyen threw that first dagger at you, I stopped time as well as jumped from one place to another. Hope filled me when my words weren't met with a shake of his head. I looked up into his shadowed eyes. Do you believe me? Do you believe it is possible that I can move through time? That I did move through time to be here? His chest rose and fell against my hand, and after a moment, he nodded. I exhaled in relief. And this other man you are attached to. Swallowing, I licked my lips. It is you, Heru. Thousands of years in the future, you are my husband. I held my breath. The wind moaned in the opening behind me. My heartbeat whooshed in my ears. Heru breathed in and out, in and out, in and out. Seconds passed, possibly minutes, and neither of us said anything. We simply stared at each other. Finally, Heru covered my hand with his own, molding it against his chest. What you witnessed with Kessie just now, it was nothing. I shook my head, my brow furrowed. It had certainly looked like something. She followed me away from camp, and I was giving her a warning to... A warning? It looked more like a promise. I met his eyes and at seeing the intensity burning in their golden depths, even in the heavy shadows, I looked away. A promise. The hand Heru had placed over mine shifted, moving slowly along my forearm and over my elbow until his fingers curled around my arm. He pulled me close enough that our chests were touching and wrapped his other arm around my back, splaying his hand on my hip. Possessively. Yes, a promise. He chuckled, low and rough. A promise to ruin her if she ever speaks ill of you to me again. My lips parted, and my breaths came faster. I raised my eyes once again, meeting his. I see. Heru slid his hand further up my arm and ran his fingertips over my shoulder along my collarbone, and up the side of my neck. He curled his fingers, tilting my chin higher. So, tell me, little queen, how do I claim you in the future? Do I battle another for the right to call you wife? Do I... I cleared my throat. Actually, I claimed you, or will claim you. My voice was breathy. Heru laughed 
These things you say, I take one step toward believing you, then one step away. My eyes narrowed. What is it that you find so hard to believe? That I would claim you? Or that you would accept? Heru lowered his head, bringing his face closer to mine. Claim me and find out, little queen. My breath caught. He smelled too good. He felt too good. Being so close to him felt too right. Like as long as we were together, we could take on anything. I bit my lip. Or has this all been an elaborate ruse? No, I... I pressed my lips together, feeling more than a little embarrassed. I didn't actually know how to claim him. You have to understand that I was not raised Netjerat. I did not know our ways, so when I claimed you, I acted on instinct. I shifted my gaze to the side, studying the rough limestone wall. There was a woman, and when I found her in your tent with you, I threatened her, warning her to stay away and never come near you again, and claimed you as my own. I almost rolled my eyes at myself. It sounded so primitive. Heru, mine. You, go away. Uh, gar. But Heru didn't look amused. He looked enthralled. Tell me, he said. He was breathing harder, like me, and the hand on my hip moved, tracing languorous designs on the linen of my dress. Tell me what you will do to any female netjarat who attempts to slip into my bed. Tell me I belong to you, and you alone. Tell me. I... I swallowed. I... I couldn't do it. Not when I knew. I knew that certain things had to happen during the millennia between now and the moment I claimed him. Certain people had to be born to him and other women, people like Nephi, who would one day save his life. Biting my lip, I shook my head, my eyes stinging. You do not understand. I cannot. Then I will, because I cannot bear this agony any longer, he said as he leaned in closer. He brushed his lips along my jaw ever so slowly before pressing his cheek against mine. I will gut any man who even attempts to lay with you. I will tear him apart because you are mine. His breath was hot against my ear. What say you, Alexandra? Do you accept my claim? Or will we be strangers from this day forward? My heart felt so full, beat so fast. I was fairly certain it was about to explode. I, I accept your claim, I whispered. In any time, in any place, I would always accept this man. I might not get to keep him forever, but I would be his for as long as I was in this time. His lips traced the hollow below my cheekbone, and I closed my eyes, basking in the glow of sensation, such a gentle touch elicited. A sweet ache swelled low in my abdomen, and I moved my hands to his sides and pressed my body against his, needing to be as close to him as possible. Hero. His mouth covered mine, and I moaned as I opened up to him. It was our first kiss for him, and about our millionth for me. But everything felt brand new. I was beginning to think that everything between us would always feel brand new. His tongue caressed mine with a slow, sensual promise, and his hands encased the back of my head, allowing him to maintain control of the intensity of the kiss. His lips, his hands, his sounds, oh God, his sounds, all contained subtle demand, a slow burn that could so easily spread into a roaring inferno of desire. I wanted more. I wanted everything his kiss was promising. 
but I didn't want to wait. I wanted to be claimed by him, bonded to him, joined with him. I wanted to feel whole again, because kissing him, feeling my body flush against his, made me realize that I'd been a fractured being since the moment I arrived in this time. I no longer had the luxury of existing as just me, a single entity, but was part of something greater. Us. I needed to feel us again. Moving my hands down the outsides of his thighs, I started gathering up his kilt. I could feel him, so swollen and needy under that fabric, and at that moment, removing that barrier was the single most important thing. He sucked in a breath when I finally found him, when my fingers fully encircled him. His hand was suddenly wrapped around my wrist, preventing my hand from moving, and his other clasped the back of my neck. He broke the kiss, his breaths hard and heavy. Leaning his forehead against mine, he said, Answer me this, Alexandra, and do not lie. I pulled back, searching his eyes and shaking my head. Answer what? I didn't understand his sudden mood shift. He was still pulsing with desire. We both were. But there was something else, an underlying current of accusation, of anger. In the future. Are we bondmates as well? I... Had I left that part out? Things had happened so quickly. Yes, Heru, we are. I meant to... I will not be trapped like this. His voice was hard and definitely contained a thread of accusation. I released him, but he maintained his hold on my wrist and neck, and my stomach twisted with dread. It was not meant to be a trap, I just... I have known you barely six days, he said, his harsh words cutting through mine. Why would you think that was enough time for me to bind my life to yours? My blood heated, but I refused to let him see how much his words hurt me. Keeping my expression blank and staring into his smoldering eyes, I said, Remember that I have known you for much longer than that. I was not thinking. I apologize. My eyes stung with unshed tears, but I gritted my teeth and held them back. I'd cried far too much since arriving in this time. I was done with it. Please release me. Heru pulled me closer and searched my eyes. His outrage at nearly being trapped melted away. You must give me time, Alexandra. Time to know you better. Time to decide for myself. I licked my lips, fighting the urge to raise my face those last few inches to once again feel the soft pressure of his lips against mine. I understand. I swallowed back a sob. I understand. I do. It's just... The sob fought back up and broke free despite my efforts to keep it contained and damn it all to hell, I started crying. It is so difficult, Haru. With a sigh, he wrapped his arms around me. I clung to him, my hands clutching his sides as I gave in to the sorrow, the desperation, the heartbreaking longing I always felt around him. I miss you so much, and being around you, but not being with you... It it's the most difficult thing. Heru didn't respond, didn't console me with words. He simply held me and rubbed my back, giving me as much of himself as he could. It was almost worse than if he'd given me nothing at all. Chapter 27 All and None I wandered away from camp amid an ocean of sand dunes, seeking solitude. I crested the nearest and started down the other side, looking back over my shoulder every few steps. Once the clusters of long, pale tents and the glow of tiny cook fires were no longer visible, I lowered myself to the ground and bent my legs, hugging my knees to my chest. I glanced back at Heru, 
who was standing sentry on the dune's peak, his hands clasped behind his back. His attention was everywhere, listening, watching, waiting for some imminent attack I didn't think would ever come. There is nobody but our people out here, I said with a sigh. I think you can leave me alone for a short while at least. Three days had passed since our near-bonding encounter during the sandstorm, since I'd learned that one day, in the distant future, we would have children, or we would perish, and Heru had been keeping his distance, or as much distance as one could keep from another person when one was sworn to protect that person and refused to be released from one's oath. Of course, he didn't know about the children thing, but still, being around him all day, every day, when he was so clearly afraid to touch me, to even move too close to me, was exhausting. He'd even recruited Set to help me practice my slow-to-develop hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. I constantly felt like I was on the verge of tears, and I wanted to punch Heru for being able to do that to me. I'd never been a crier, not until I met him. Healthy, Lex. That's really, really healthy. But honestly, most of those tears had been caused by a pep set, and Heru's presence had merely been a coincidence. Even my current situation could be laid at a pep set's feet. Thinking that made me feel a little better. Well, Heru, if you insist on remaining, at least come sit with me. It makes me nervous to have you standing there. I am watching over you. Perhaps, but you also might be making silly faces at the back of my head, or... His lips quirked. I have not. I would not. I swear it, little queen. It was the first time he'd called me that since the sandstorm. I smiled weakly. Come sit with me, Heru, please. He relaxed his stance and released his hands, letting them hang at his sides as he started down the sandy slope toward me. He sat on my right, keeping a few inches between our hips, and stretched his legs out in front of him. The distance made my heart clench just a bit. Taking a deep breath, I forced myself to smile and turned my face up to gaze at the night sky. It was so different than the one I was used to, dimmed by city lights and viewed through a haze of pollution. This ancient, pristine night sky stole my breath every single time I saw it. The stars were brilliant and too many, bleeding together like freckles after too much time in the sun. And then there was the Milky Way, sweeping across the sky in a nebulous arc. According to one ancient Egyptian creation myth, the goddess, Newt, would swallow the sun raw every evening and give birth to him the following morning, over and over again. I'd read in a book once that the ancients believed the arc of the Milky Way to be Newt's body arching over the earth, sheltering us all while we waited for Ra to be reborn. Does it give you peace? Heru asked. Hmm? Staring into the heavens, he cleared his throat. I can only assume it brings you some manner of peace to see something familiar in a place that is clearly so strange to you. I raised my eyebrows and looked at him taking in the sharp edges and hard planes of his face, the silvery sheen of starlight in his eyes, the lush curve of his lips. I see something familiar every time I'm around you. The words were out before I could stop them. Heru frowned and averted his gaze. But seeing me does not bring you peace. Perhaps not, but it does keep me alive and healthy. I hugged my knees more tightly. Heru was silent for a long time. This will make me sound quite dense, but I have to admit that I did not consider that you would be suffering from bonding with Rawls were you to be away from me for too long. He shook his head. I cannot imagine what that must be like. No, I said. You cannot. And to ease the sharp edge of my words, I offered him a smile, albeit a sad one. 
but one day you will understand. Heru's eyebrows drew together, though he didn't respond. I returned my attention to the stars. Do they bring you peace? They trouble me. Surprised, I lowered my eyes to him again. He wasn't looking up at the sky, but at me. I do not understand them, he said, and things I do not understand trouble me. I wasn't sure if he was talking about the stars anymore. Swallowing, I forced myself to look away. I lay back on the sandy slope and stared up at a scene more beautiful than any piece of art. In time, people will come to understand the stars better, and then they will start to explore them, much as they will explore every part of this world. Explore the heavens. I could see him out of the corner of my eye, staring down at me, while I gazed up at the night sky. How could we explore something that is not of this world? Because it is of this universe, I said, laughing softly to myself. To be the one teaching him something. It was pretty damn fun. The stars are, they're like our sun, for the most part. Huge orbs of burning gas. But some are like our own world, with lands and seas, and others are giant balls of ice, and others are... Glancing at him, I felt a flush spread up my cheeks and down to my chest. Sorry, I got a little carried away. Heru merely continued to smile his small, secret smile and stare down at me. I sat up. That probably did not make any sense anyway. An astronomer I am not. He tilted his head to the side. What is astronomer? I guess you could say it as a person whose job is to study the heavens. Why would anybody make this their job? For what purpose? To learn? To understand? I shrugged. I suppose it serves the same purpose as what I do in my time. Uncover what ancient people left behind. Artifacts. Ruins. Their bodies. To understand them better. And... What do you call someone who does what you do? An archaeologist? The corners of Heru's mouth twitched. So even though you were unaware of our people, that you might one day be able to view times long past in the art, you found your own way to peer into the past. His eyes squinted as he smiled. You intrigue me so very much, little queen. My receding blush flamed back to life, and I picked at a pulled thread in the skirt of my dress. I would like to hear more about these other worlds that are like our own. My gaze snapped to his. Really? He nodded. Um, okay. I curled my legs under me so I was kneeling, facing him, and started drawing in the sand between us. So, this is the sun, and... Did you know that when you are excited, you sometimes slip into your native tongue? I offered him a small smile. Sorry. Returning to my drawing in the sand, I told him about the solar system, providing those details I could about each planet and some of the moons. Heru found Earth's moon and the sun the most intriguing, likely because those were the two most present in his everyday life. He was fascinated by the fact that the sun was so much larger than the moon, but didn't appear so in the sky, which only amazed him further because it made him think about how far away the sun really was. I'd expected him to fight me on the whole, the earth is round concept, but he merely nodded, his eyes narrowed in thought. Just because he was a younger version of himself, his intelligence was no less sharp. His focus on a subject no less intense. I was just diving into a diatribe about Pluto, arguing that it didn't matter to me if there were a million hunks of ice floating around out there just like it. Pluto would always be a planet in my mind when Heru shocked me speechless. Do you have any idea how much I love you? He said in heavily accented English. My mouth fell open and I snapped it shut before I could look like a buffoon for too long. I stared at him, searching his eyes. Will you tell me what that means now? He asked. 
I looked down at my fairly elaborate sand drawing of the solar system, poking little craters into Mars with the tip of my pointer finger. I do not think I should. It will make you uncomfortable. Because you did not mistake me for Nguyen, he said. Because you were speaking to me, were you not? I added a flying saucer near the moon. Please, little queen, Alexandra. Heru captured my hand and started rubbing his thumb against my palm. Tell me. Staring down at our joined hands, I swallowed roughly, and then I told him. But you were not really speaking to me. You were speaking to who I will become. I nodded and hated myself just a little bit for doing it. Marcus, it is your name in my time. My ba traveled to my present while I was unconscious. It does that sometimes, and I found you there. My voice grew thick. You wrapped your arms around me and kissed me, and blinking, I took deep breaths. And you told me you loved me. And then I was waking up, and you were right there in front of my eyes. I looked into his eyes, searching those shimmering silver-gold depths. I said it to Marcus, and to you, and to every version of you between then and now. I think that if I were him, Heru smiled ruefully, which I am, what would upset me the most about this situation? would be not knowing what you were going through. Not being able to do things like this, to sit and stare at the stars, or to know what you were doing all day. Even now, even unbonded, it pains me to think of... He clenched his jaw. The thought of not knowing. I think that would be utter misery. I shook my head, heart swollen with hope despite my mind not entirely understanding his point. What are you suggesting? Why not leave something behind for me to find in the future? A record of your time here. It will give you something to do once we are at the Oasis, other than training with Nguyen and with Set, Nikure, and me, of course. My lips parted, and I grinned. I think that is a wonderful idea. My excitement was short-lived, and I bit my lip, feeling the need to keep our budding, proto-relationship based on honesty. I gave his hand a squeeze. I have to tell you something, but I need you to promise to listen, to not say anything until I am finished. Heru eyed me, his expression contemplative, his eyes wary. Go ahead. I took a deep breath, and then I dove in. I cannot stay in this time. I, there will come a day, maybe in a few weeks, maybe in a few months, when I must return to my own time. He shook his head violently. No, I will not allow. Be quiet, you promised. I did not. I rolled my eyes. Just let me finish, I said. When I leave, if we have bonded, if you decide that is what you want, then I will be able to create a shield within you that will prevent the withdrawals. But I will know you are gone, and... I shook my head. No, Heru, you will not know, because I will lock those memories away in your mind. He withdrew his hand from mine. I see. He seemed on the cusp of saying more, but instead... He pushed off the sand and stood. His sudden distance, sudden coldness, shredded my heart. Hero, let us return. I sucked in a breath to protest further, but exhaled instead of saying anything. Deflating, I stood and walked with Hero back to camp. Neither of us uttered another word. Part 5. Netgerat Oasis. Present Day. Chapter 28. Seek and Hide. So, it's true then. You were there when Nguyen died. 
I said to Asset during one of my How to Be a Real Measurette lessons. The blood running through my veins felt as electrified as it did when I was around Carson. For nearly a week, we'd been camped beside the jagged, sand-swept, rocky lumps that had supposedly been part of the Net Girat Oasis thousands of years ago, and I'd finally worked up the nerve to ask Asset if she'd been at the oasis when Nguyen died, and the whole place collapsed in on itself. Or so legend said. Asset smiled, making her cheeks rounder, which only made her prettier. She was one of those gorgeous people who I just couldn't hate, even though I really wanted to. I mean, really, who looks like that? Because she was just too effing nice. I suppose it made sense that she would be perfect looking, since she was Marcus's twin sister and all. And really, nobody could deny that he was drool-worthy to the nth degree. I also supposed that Marcus must have missed out on the nice gene, or maybe a set stole his. I was there, here, at the oasis, a set said, but I was not present for the great father's death, no. She was sitting across from me at the top of a sand dune near camp, her legs crossed and her hands clasped in her lap. Are you ready to try again? I bit my lip. I really wanted to ask her more questions. Are the legends true? Was the oasis home to a city made of crystal? Did the whole thing collapse when Nguyen died? Is that why it looks like a big old pile of rubble? But I was practicing using restraint, hoping doing so would make people stop treating me like a pre-manifestation teen and more like a full-fledged Nezirette. And I was grateful to Asset because she treated me like I mattered, like I could help, like she actually gave a shit about me. With Dom, Jenny, Nephi, and Alexander still in Cairo, waiting for Lex's parents and grandma, and everyone else pretty much expecting me to turn traitor like my mom, Asset was one of two people I could call a friend right now, Carson being the other. I didn't know why she treated me so well, but I was really grateful she did. Exhaling, I nodded. Yeah, okay, let's check again. Last time, it seemed sort of stable, or more stable, I guess. And the 23rd time's the charm, right? I smiled at her nervously. Ever since the set incident, the ought had been unstable. Damn nothingness. It definitely wasn't the best time to learn how to navigate the ought, but... I'd had some of the best teachers available, first Dom, then Asset, so I'd say I was pretty lucky. You really think having me with you in there is helping, or at least isn't hurting? Asset met my smile with a kind one of her own. If you were hurting my progress in this search for a stable portion of art, I would be conducting it on my own, she said matter-of-factly, and... More importantly, you proved your devotion to Lex when you sacrificed the chance to ever reach full maturity in order to rescue her. Because of that, I know I can trust you, and I would not enter the art with one I could not trust. Yeah, but everyone here is devoted to Lex, I said, glancing behind me at the camp of almost a hundred Nezirats. It grew every day as more of Marcus's people trickled in. Everyone but one, Asset countered. There is a traitor here. This I know. I opened my mouth to assure her that it most definitely, absolutely, in no possible way, was me at all. She silenced my unvoiced words with another smile. Not you. This I also know. I frowned. How do you know? Or is this another one of those things you can't tell anyone? Along with getting to know how dang nice a set was, I'd also learned that she carried more secrets than anyone I'd ever met. Ever. She nodded. Does Marcus know there's a traitor? Again, she nodded. But there is little he can do about it. What will happen will happen. She held out her hand to me. Come, now. 
let us link and make one final attempt to find stability. Her eyes sparkled with some of those secrets. I've got a good feeling about this one. Brow furrowed, I placed my palm against hers and curled my fingers around the back of her hand. Here goes nothing. We lurched into a tidal wave of art, rolling around and around as the psychedelic colors stuttered, flashing in and out like they were being broadcast with a crappy signal. Honestly, not the most comforting situation to be in. It is better, yes? Aset practically shouted. I nodded as my stomach lurched. How I seemed to have developed motion sickness when I didn't technically have either a stomach or an inner ear, I mean, I was a disembodied ba at the moment, was beyond me. Concentrate on finding stability, Katarina. Aset's voice was smooth and calm, and her incorporeal hand was firm in mine. Think only about finding the nearest pocket of stability. She'd repeated the same words over and over again throughout the lesson. I squeezed my fake eyelid shut, blocking out the here one moment, gone the next swirling colors, and concentrated. Stability. Stability. Let's go, stability. Show me the stability. Give me stability or give me... Open your eyes, Katharina, Asad said, giving my hand a squeeze. I did, only to find myself exactly where I'd started, sitting on the top of a sand dune beside the enormous jumble of wind and sand eroded, crumbling limestone that was all that remained of the Netgerat oasis. Except I was still in the yacht. We've done it, she grinned. We've finally found a bubble of stability. I stared around at the pristine, unwavering scene for all of two seconds, then released Asset's hand, jumped to my feet, and started dancing around with hops and kicks and flailing arms and possibly a few stumbles. We did it! We did it! We did it! I sang over and over. Not even Marcus had been able to enter a stable portion of the yacht since we'd arrived at the oasis. It was like this place in particular was even more affected by the unpredictable nothingness in the ot than anywhere else, like it was the Bermuda Triangle of the ot. Yes, we were lucky, Asset said as she stood and brushed off her pants. She started down the dune. Come along, Katarina. We don't know how long this pocket will last, and who knows when we'll get another shot. I jogged down the slope to catch up with her, having a much easier time moving across the sand now that it was locked in place in an echo, making it more like concrete. Oh my god, can you imagine Marcus's face when we tell him we found a stable spot? Can you? I clapped, giggling and cackling, then linked my arm with the sets and picked up the pace, pulling her at a part walk, part jog, to the edge of the rocky rubble that had once been the Net Gerat Oasis. Aset slipped her arm free from mine and, once again, clasped my hand. Whatever you do, Katarina, do not let go. There was a distinct thread of warning in her voice, making me uneasy. Linked as we are, it should be much easier to maintain this pocket of stability, now that we've actually found one, until we can find what we're looking for. We're looking for something? This was news to me. I thought it was just another lesson in how to use my new powers. What are we looking for? Asat closed her eyes, and her grip on my hand tightened. We are going back to the moment immediately after Lex leaves the past, shortly after Nguyen's death, and the collapse of the oasis, and finding the place where the survivors emerged from the rubble, as it is the only way back in. I continued to stare at her. People were in there when it happened? And they survived? They did. Now, hush, dear, I must concentrate. As she spoke, the golden sand and clear blue sky and jagged rocks dissolved into a rainbow mist that glided past in vertical lines. With a flash, the colors were gone, and we were once again standing in the desert.
Except now the stars glittered overhead like an ocean of diamonds. Before us, the eroded, rocky rubble had been replaced by a mound of craggy, crunching stone. A short ways away on the right, there was an arched opening in the mass of limestone, like the mouth of a tunnel, and covering the opening completely was an opaque, almost shimmering slab of... Well, I didn't actually know what it was, but it was definitely acting as a door, blocking the tunnel. And there, Katarina, is our way into the oasis, Asset said. Once again, the colors of the aught surrounded us, and when they flickered away, we were back to standing before the eroded sand-covered rocks in the present time. Asset moved closer to the general location of the opalescent door. But all that was there now was a patch of sand in front of a tallish boulder. The echo started to flicker, and both Asset and I stared around as it faded away into nothingness. We lost it. Asset turned bright eyes on me, and her lips spread into a victorious grin. It doesn't matter. I found what I was looking for. Chapter 29 Over and Under Marcus was sitting behind the folding desk in the office in the front of his two-room canvas tent, Asset and me standing side by side opposite him. We were all using the equipment left over from the excavation a few weeks ago, and though the location had changed, the layout was more or less the same, except for the bathroom and shower trailer. That hadn't made it across the miles of desert, which sucked. In my opinion, a five-gallon jug of water per person per day was not enough water to stay both hydrated and clean. Your serpent, Marcus studied a set in me. His eyes seemed to pick apart and weigh each tiny little nuance of our expressions and stances. And you really think there's some part of the oasis under there? A set maintained her smile, though it was starting to wilt and nodded for the thousandth time. Yes, I'm certain. Why don't you believe me when I say that I remember all? Because I don't, Heru said, not taking his eyes off her. And we've discussed this, dear brother. It is what had to be, I sighed. My feet were getting tired from standing. We'd been there for nearly an hour, and I was starting to feel a little lightheaded. Look, Marcus, I saw it too. Not inside or anything, but the huge slab of whatever it was. Ah, Asat clarified, was definitely blocking the mouth of some kind of tunnel. Marcus stared at me for a moment, then shifted his focus back to Asat and squinted the barest amount. All right, he nodded. We'll start digging tonight, while it's cooler. Hopefully we'll be done by morning. He paused hesitated, and you're sure that whatever's left under there is safe. It's not going to collapse on our people. As that smile regained its brilliance, few places have ever been safer. Yeah, she was super nice and sweet and stuff, but holy hell could a set be mysterious when she wanted to be. Marcus pointed to the arched, opaque slab that had been uncovered by the seventh rotation of Nazareth's, just as the sun peeked over the dunes to the east. So you're telling me that that is made of art, like this? He touched the small lump under his shirt, which I assumed to be the bottle Asset had delivered to him when she'd first shown up nearly two weeks ago. And that Lex made it? Asset nodded. Carson and I stood behind them a few feet, sneaking glimpses between shoulders when we could. His fingers brushed against the back of my hand, and my eyes snapped to his face. He was watching me, not the door, a shy smile curving his lips. My heart melted into a puddle of heart-shaped goo. His smile widened, his blue eyes sparkling, and he took hold of my hand, slipping his fingers between mine. Yeah, complete and utter heart goo. The rest of the city was made of, Marcus said. I lived here for 
over a thousand years before the collapse. How did I not know the Great Father built the whole place out of art? He did not want you to know. It was a dangerous thing, knowing what he was capable of. Marcus was quiet for a long time, standing beside his sister and staring at the tall door of quartz-like art. Do you think a pep will return? He asked her quietly. She shrugged. Eventually. Then perhaps I shouldn't enter. Shouldn't learn Lex's secrets. If he returns and... Asat touched his arm. He will return. And there is only one place where you will be safe from possession. For now. She nodded toward the door. He cannot possess you when you are surrounded by so much art. Besides, just because he's possessing you, that doesn't mean he has access to your thoughts. He'll only know what you choose to share with him. Marcus shook his head. How could you possibly know? Asat laughed, a cheerful, chiming sound, and linked her arm with his. In time, all will make sense, dear brother, for you sooner than foremost, I think. You shall see. She guided him forward, ignoring his obvious hesitance. Come on. I exchanged a look with Carson. So, we found the door to get inside. My brow furrowed. How do you think we get through it? Carson shrugged and returned his gaze to the slab of Ott, and his eyes bulged at the same time as murmurs and whispers broke out among the dozens of Nezurettes standing around the sloping hole watching the siblings approach the door. He tugged on my hand. Look, cat, look. I did, and my mouth fell open. The door was glowing, just like the ought chest had done when Lex had approached it back in Senenmut's underground temple. Marcus and Aset were dark silhouettes against the bright, iridescent glow of the door. I could just make out her profile as she looked up at her brother. She started nodding, and Marcus extended his hand toward the glowing slab of Ott. With a sizzling sound, it dissolved into a myriad of colorful, misty tendrils. They slowly expanded upward, outward, fading until they evaporated completely, and the slab of Ott was gone. Through the opening it left behind, there was nothing but absolute darkness. Marcus looked over his shoulder snapping orders to whichever Nezure or Nezurette was closest. Bring the LED rope, flashlights, headlamps, anything that will provide light. He glanced around. Carlyle. Yes, sir, said Marcus's man, who handled pretty much everything as he brushed past my right shoulder and made his way down the ramp of sand toward Marcus and the doorway. Whenever I heard Carlyle speak, his words very proper and British, I dubbed him Jeeves in my mind. Call Dom or Nephi, Marcus told him. They should be leaving Cairo with Lex's family in a few hours. I'm aware, sir, Marcus raised one eyebrow. Tell them to procure generators, LED ropes, and whatever else you think will need to light up whatever's left in there. He pointed toward the mouth of the tunnel with his chin. Very well. With a slight bow of his head, Carlyle turned and started walking away from Marcus. He pulled one of the uber high-tech satellite cell phones, all of Marcus's top people seemed to have, out of his back pocket as he walked. A skinny, blonde Nezurette I'd mentally labeled as one of Marcus's minions, one of the many of his people who weren't old enough, powerful enough, or useful enough to warrant a seat at the grown-ups table, where all of Marcus's plans were discussed and put into action ran past Carlyle at a jog, her arms filled with flashlights and headlamps. She skidded to a halt beside Marcus. Here you go, Heru. She lowered her eyes in deference, but I just thought it made her look weak. With a wet mop attitude like hers, she'd never climb high in the Nezure ranks. Thank you, Amelia, Marcus said, fishing a headlamp out from the tangle and handing it to a set before taking one for himself. After he had his headlamp situated on his buzzed head, looking pretty silly in my opinion, he selected a flashlight. 
one of the enormous ones that shone as brightly as a spotlight. Without another word, without even a glance around to see if anyone else was ready to follow, Marcus plunged into the darkness, quickly becoming little more than two retreating beams of light. Asset selected a flashlight of her own and started looking around, scanning the faces like she was searching for someone. When her eyes landed on me, she grinned and waved me over. Come on, Katarina. You're just as responsible for finding this as I am, so you must explore with me. Her smile was so genuine, her eyes so warm, that I thought, had she been human, she would have made an excellent mother. She wouldn't have betrayed us all and abandoned her own daughter, I thought bitterly. I took a step toward her, but hesitated, glancing back at Carson. I bit my lip. Go, he said, smiling and shaking his head in a way that made me weak in the knees. He laughed, making his bright blue eyes sparkle in the morning light. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Cat. You cannot miss it. Go! I grinned, feeling silly. Okay, I said, and before I could lose my nerve, I stepped back to him and lifted my face to his, pressing my lips against his cheek. I'll tell you all about it, I called over my shoulder as I jogged toward a set. You'd better. Uh, ma'am, Carlyle called just as I reached a set. Pick out the headlamp and a flashlight, dear, a set said to me, then looked up at Carlyle, who'd hustled over to stop at the lip of the ramp. Yes? He is such a Jeeves, I thought, smiling to myself as I pulled a headlamp with a lime green band onto my head. I was pretty sure it was the same one I'd used before. Would you please let Heru know that Alexander is on his way and should arrive within the hour? but that Dominic will make the arrangements requested before picking up the Larsons and Susan Ivanov from the airport, then bringing them here along with Nephi and Jennifer Larson. Smiling, Asset nodded. Yes, of course, and I'm sure my brother would appreciate it if you had Alexander join us in here as soon as he arrives, and no others until then. As you wish, ma'am, he bowed his head to her. Thank you, Carlyle. She wrapped her tiny hand around my arm just above the elbow and started leading me into the opening. I couldn't see the light from Marcus's headlamp or flashlight at all anymore. And, ma'am, Asset paused and glanced back at Carlyle. Alexander informed me that he's picked up another Negere, a man who goes by the name of Nick and claims to be one of your people, he knew enough about you and our plans that Alexander decided to grant his request to join him on his journey out here. Carlyle attempted a smile, and a muscle in his cheek twitched. Though Alexander should have informed Heru before deciding to bring him, I thought it prudent to verify his identity with you before they drew much closer. Ah, yes, Asset offered Carlyle a smile, much more genuine than his own. Nick is mine, and I apologize for any confusion. He was supposed to meet us in Cairo, but he was held up and must have decided hitching a ride would be the easiest way to catch up to me. For once, she was the one to bow her head to him. I should have informed you, and I apologize for that oversight. I hope you'll forgive me. Of course, ma'am, Carlyle turned away. Before he could take a step, Asset said, And, Carlyle, if you hear word of anyone else claiming to be one of my people, I assure you, they are lying and should be handled accordingly. I understand, Carlyle nodded before continuing on his way. Shall we? Asset pulled me toward the opening again, releasing my arm as I matched her slow steps into the darkness. It didn't remain dark for long. Under the assault of both of our headlamps and flashlights, the darkness gave way to curved, silvery walls. A closer look showed me it was less silvery and more like seamless, barely opaque stone. I followed the wall on the right upward until my headlamp showed an arching overhead before cascading down the other side. 
I peered closer at the floor, but as far as I could tell, it was made of the same stone, though it was flat. My skin tingled, the hairs standing on end, as I realized something I should have from the moment we entered the tunnel. It wasn't made of stone. It was made of ought. Honestly, if I wasn't seeing this with my own two eyes, there's no way I'd believe there was an entire tunnel built of effing ought, I said, as I continued to focus on the tunnel floor a few feet ahead of us. I mean, really? Really? It's crazy, right? Grabbing my wrist, a set tugged on my arm, and I ceased my meandering pace onward. Look, she said, slowly scanning her flashlight beam across the way ahead. The combination of my increasingly sensitive Nezuret vision and our meager artificial light enabled me to see at least some of what lay ahead, a ghostly ancient city of large, graceful structures composed of narrow archways, elongated spires, and fluted columns. A sinuous darkness curved lazily between the buildings, drinking in the light, and I assumed it was some sort of spring-fed underground stream, snaking through an underground city that appeared to also be made of ought. Unfreaking believable It seems so impossible, Aset said, her voice filled with longing and loss. It feels like it was just yesterday that I left her in here. Her words shocked me out of my stunned state. Her? Who? Lex? I touched Aset's shoulder, and when she didn't seem to notice, I gripped it and gave her a hard shake. Aset, are you talking about Lex? Are you saying you left her in this, this crypt? Did you leave her in here to die? No! Aset stared at me, her eyes wide and wild and glistening in the pale artificial light. No, I... She made me. She told me. She... Aset turned me to face her and gripped my upper arm so hard that I winced. I left because she told me to, and when I returned, the door was sealed. She shook her head, her shimmering eyes boring into me. It had to stay sealed. She released me, but continued to shake her head. We will know her fate not long from now, I think. We will know all of our fates. She forced a smile. All will work out, you will see. I blinked, narrowed my eyes, and crossed my arms, shrugging to escape her talon-like grip. Just so you know, you sound like a total crazy person. Asset let out a breathy laugh. I would imagine so, Katarina. She smiled and sighed. Come, it is too dark to make much out right now, and I have a feeling that I know where Heru went. Where? I asked, following her down a barren slope toward the stream. Home. Chapter 30 Death and Decay A set led me across a narrow, arched bridge bordered by delicate, ought filigree railings. The stream definitely had to be fed by a spring, because I could hear it burbling. A slow brush of my flashlight beam showed me that the stream was lined by what appeared to be paving stones, making me think it was actually more of a canal. How is this even here? I whispered, afraid that speaking too loudly would cause it all to come crashing down around us. Heru's home is just this way, Aset said, flicking her flashlight along the path, lining the opposite side of the canal. She waited for me at the foot of the bridge, and once I was across, started walking along the edge of the canal. Nguyen is responsible for creating the Nijerat Oasis, or cavern, I suppose it might be called now, she said with a roundabout glance. It has been here as long as I've been alive, though I suppose the oasis did grow over the years. But Lex is the one responsible for concealing it for keeping it out of the spotlight, for protecting it 
from the desert. I looked at Azette, watching her delicate features as we walked. But how did she do all of that? How is this not buried in, like, a mile of rock? Asset paused and raised her flashlight beam to the cavern ceiling. Look up. What do you see? I followed the light, but couldn't tell much other than that the cavern ceiling was high overhead. So, a cave popped up around this place at just the right time? You're funny, Asset said her tinkling laugh making me smile. It didn't just pop up. Lex did it. She erected a dome of art just as the limestone cliffs shielding the oasis came crashing down on top of us. Asset's gaze became distant, and all remnants of her momentary humor disappeared. The ground shook. The screams. You cannot imagine the terror. It was clear from the tense set of her features that she didn't actually want to talk about whatever she was reliving in her memories. So I gave her a gentle tug to keep going. Sounds scary. You said Haru's place is this way? Asat cleared her throat. Um, yes, she said, veering to the right down a narrow alleyway between two rows of crumbling two-story buildings that appeared to be constructed from regular old stone, not odd. It's just this way, across the orchard and gardens. I raised my flashlight, shining the beam along the way ahead. One of the more fanciful buildings sat on the opposite side of the orchard, more like a haunted forest with its sparse skeletal trees its face composed of three graceful archways, two smaller ones flanking a larger, which appeared to be an open doorway. As we reached the opening, I saw there was no door at all. I guess there wasn't much crime here. Asset stepped through the threshold and into what I could only describe as a small palace. It was more than a little haunting in the dim light. There was no need for doors she said, Nuin forbade us from willfully harming one another, and nobody would dare defy him, at least not until the end. I followed her into the palace. There were piles of unidentifiable things on the dust-covered floor here and there, what was left of the furniture after it rotted and collapsed in on itself, I supposed. As we moved from open space to open space through successive archways, my cursory inspection showed me that only a few pieces remained intact, all apparently made of some stone or another. It was so eerie. If ever a place was haunted, this one would be. Asat led me through one final arched doorway and stopped, staring at the man kneeling on the floor on one side of the room. There was more stone furniture in here, what appeared to be three beds arranged against three of the walls. Two were empty. One was covered in something that looked an awful lot like a glass coffin. A set grabbed my wrist, preventing me from moving further into the room. Marcus's head was bowed, his forehead leaning against the coffin. He had to have heard us enter, and if his eyes were open, he would see our headlamps and flashlights illuminating the eerie space. But he didn't raise his head. He didn't appear to be moving at all. I was starting to get the sick feeling that the thing he was kneeling beside didn't just look like a coffin. It was cool in the aught cavern compared to the desert overhead, but the chill washing over my skin had nothing to do with the temperature. Heru? Aset's voice was gentle. I don't remember this, Aset said, his own voice a quiet rasp. I remember her dying from a fever, but I don't remember this. Her dying? I looked from a set to Marcus and back. Are they talking about Lex? I was here with you when it happened, as was Lex. A set sighed as she released my wrist and moved further into the room to stand beside Marcus. She gazed down at the thing and reached out to brush a thick layer of dust off the top. 
She loved little Percy very much, I think. She was my favorite. I know, Hero. I know. Feeling like an intruder, I snuck closer. I just couldn't help myself. The coffin was mostly opaque. Thank God, because dead bodies are so not my thing, and I could just make out the shape of a person inside. A very small person. A set placed her hand on Marcus's shoulder. Come, dear brother, there is more you must see. It took him a moment, but after a sniff and a throat clearing, Marcus stood and looked at his sister. Did you know it would be like this, under the rubble? Asat tilted her head to the side. In a way, yes, this is how it looked, though with less dust and rot when we left. She glanced around the high-ceilinged room. It is very strange to be back and for the city to be so, she hesitated, so dark, so empty, so dead. She took hold of Marcus's hand and led him back out the way we come in. Through a half dozen archways and rooms of various sizes and out to the empty space that must have once been a garden, I followed hanging back to give them their privacy. I considered retracing my steps and finding my way out of the fantastical ghost town because it was starting to seriously creep me out, but the thought of getting lost creeped me out even more. So I opted to stay with Asset and Marcus. We wound along the curving paths paved with worn limestone between more of the regular two-story buildings some of which were little more than piles of crumbled stone, and around a few more of the graceful ought structures, similar to Marcus's home. We only stopped after we'd rounded the largest, most graceful and fantastical of them all, and reached what looked to me like a mausoleum from a century-old cemetery. Turning away from the underwhelming little structure, I looked at the ought palace. My eyes followed it as it flowed upward, a few of its sleek spires actually punctured the cavern ceiling. I'm not sure exactly how much of your memory she altered, Asat said behind me. You and Lex spent much time in here together. Do you remember this place at all? No. Marcus's voice was rough. Is it his tomb? It is, and more. Lex built most of it during her time here, and you carried Nguyen's body here so she could inter him within, along with her story. Her story? I glanced over my shoulder to see them standing side by side, facing the mausoleum. Marcus was shaking his head. I don't remember any of that. I thought, I thought we left him in his bed when the walls came crashing down. Asset nodded. Set remembered much the same. Lex had so many memories to alter. I'm sure she would have left you with more complete, more settling alternate memories if she could have. But she'd already been through so much, expended so much power. She did what she could. Marcus looked at her. Was she all right? Asset shrugged. More or less. She experienced much during her time here. Then changed, grew. You will be quite amazed when she returns, I think. Amazed and proud to call her your bondmate. She raised a hand, touching his arm. She is a remarkable Nezaret, and both Nekure and I were sorry to have to say goodbye to her when we did. Nekure, Heru shook his head. I completely forgot. Where is he? He paused. Is he still? Alive. Quite, Asat said. He's on his way. She laughed. He's changed much over the years. You'll barely recognize him. She pointed to the mausoleum, to what appeared to be a door set in the front between two slender, grooved columns. It is like the other attuned to your and Lex's combined bonding pheromones. You must touch it. 
Marcus stepped forward and reached out his arm. Like before, the slab of ought barring his way dissolved into a colorful mist before disappearing completely. He shone his flashlight in the opening, revealing a steep stairwell that descended into darkness. And also, like before, he plunged onward without hesitation. Part of me wondered if he thought he might actually find Lex down there, like she'd been waiting for him to find her for millennia. Biting my lip, I shivered, awash in dread. What if she is down there? Come along, Katerina. There is nothing to be afraid of. A set held her arm out to me, and together, we descended the stairs. What the... A set rushed forward a few steps. Oh my god. Marcus was standing beside another coffin, only this one was as clear as glass, and most definitely occupied, and the body it contained looked like it had stopped breathing only seconds ago. Mouth hanging open, I made it down the final few steps and, dazed, walked toward the coffin. I stood on the opposite side from Marcus and Asset and stared down at a face that was almost as shocking as the body's pristine state. It's you, I said, raising my eyes to Marcus's face. It's not, he said. It's the Great Father. Nguyen? Ignoring me, he tore his gaze away from Nguyen's peaceful face to look at a set. Did you know about this as well? She shook her head, her eyes wide, containing equal parts wonder and horror. He looks exactly as he did when we left him down here. How? She looked at her brother. How is this possible? How should I know? I cleared my throat and licked my lips, my eyes flicking down to the man who only appeared to be slumbering beneath that thin barrier of ought. I, um, don't mean to be rude or anything, but are you sure he's dead? Yes, Asset said softly. It was what had to be. Both she and Marcus returned to staring down at the over 4,000-year dead body. Okay? Suddenly, the idea of getting lost as I tried to find my way out of this underground funhouse of WTF wasn't the creepiest option. Continuing to stare at Nguyen's dead, unrotted body was. I backed away from the coffin and turned around to study the walls. Walls were definitely a better, less creepy choice. There were hieroglyphs inscribed in neat columns on every available surface, though I had no clue what they said, and a single arched doorway set in the center of each wall. I made my way toward the one opposite the stairs and stood on its threshold while I scanned the space beyond with a beam of my flashlight. The ceiling was high, and like the doorways, arched, and the walls were covered with writing as well, though this script was flowy and cursive, and impossible as it seemed, written in English. Lips parted and eyes wide, I stepped closer to the wall on my right and studied the words. Sandstorm, and we almost bonded again. But I screwed up. I didn't tell you everything, and once you found out that we're bonded in the future, well, let's just say that things went downhill from there. You weren't too excited about the idea of... There was no doubt in my mind that these were Lex's words. I stopped reading, feeling like I was peeking into her diary, and swept my flashlight beam over the rest of the room. When the light touched the far wall, maybe twenty paces away, I yelped and dropped my flashlight. Someone was standing in a recessed part of the wall. Heart racing and fingers shaking, I fumbled to pick up the flashlight and retrain its beam on the person. She was standing exactly where she'd been, exactly as she'd been. Because it's a statue, moron, I muttered to myself. I took a deep breath, then another, and started across the room. The closer I drew to the statue, the wider I opened my eyes. 
She was tall and slender, wearing a simple, sleeveless dress that almost reached her ankles. One foot was placed ahead of the other, like she was stepping out of the alcove, and her left hand was raised, the fingertips touching the pendant hanging around her neck, which I was positive would be a thumb-sized falcon. Marcus had given its likeness to Lex a few weeks ago, when we'd still been in Florence. She was smiling, just a little, in a way that made me think she knew something, a secret, or a joke, or the truth about everything. But her eyes were sad, filled with longing as she gazed downward. Marcus? I whispered. I cleared my throat and tried again. Marcus? What? His one-word response echoed around the room. I spun, fully expecting to find him standing right behind me, or at least in the doorway. But there was no sign of him. He was probably still staring at Nguyen's not-decayed-even-for-a-second body. You should see this, I said. You'll want to see this. She's right, I heard a set say. You will want to see what awaits you in the other chambers. Go, dear brother. Marcus appeared in the doorway, his flashlight beam hitting me directly in the eyes. I raised my hand to shield my vision. Dude! What is it that I need to see? He said as he strode into the room. I blinked, confused. It seemed pretty obvious to me, but... Then I realized I was standing in front of the statue and probably blocking his view entirely. It didn't matter. He was sidetracked by the writing on the walls after barely two steps. He moved closer to the left wall and murmured something in another language while he traced Lex's letters with his fingertips. Marcus, you should... Not now, Cat, he said softly. Marcus, I said not... His words were cut off abruptly as he spun around, facing me, and finally catching sight of the statue. I moved away from it as he approached, his steps slow and almost hesitant. He stopped directly in front of her and raised his hand to trace his fingertips over every part of her face, just as he'd done with her words. With a harsh, choking noise, he fell to his knees and rested his forehead against the front of her skirt. His hands clutched the sides of her dress as his whole body shook. Marcus Bahur, Heru, former leader of the Council of Seven, general to our people, and one of the most ancient and powerful Nezirats alive, was breaking down before my very eyes. I jumped at a gentle touch on my shoulder. Come, Katharina, let us give him some time alone. Nodding and numb with shock, I let a set guide me back into Nguyen's burial chamber and up the stairs. Ah, yes, she said as we emerged from the mausoleum. She pointed across the cavern where tiny points of light were bouncing and shooting around haphazardly. I thought it was about time for them to show up. She waved her flashlight in their direction and raising her voice enough that Nejere ears might hear her from that distance, said, Meet us at the main bridge. It was far from a shout. One of their beams of light waved back in response. But if they said anything, my ears weren't good enough to pick up on it. Aset started walking, and I jogged a few steps to catch up to her. But how will they know where the main bridge is? Aset glanced at me, her eyebrows raised. Because Nick is there. And that makes a difference because... Aset smiled, like she only just understood my confusion. Because Nick is from here. Chapter 31 Warn and Worry Staring up the words Lex had somehow inscribed into the solidified fabric of space and time, I sighed. I'd been sitting cross-legged on the floor, also made of solidified aught, along with pretty much every part of 
pretty much every other building in the Oasis cavern thing. A notebook on my lap and my pen scratching against the paper as I copied down Lex's words for hours. There were dozens of underground rooms like this, all with two-inch-tall words covering every available wall and ceiling space. Some rooms had arched ceilings, others just regular old flat ceilings, and the largest of all had a dome. I got the impression that Lex had been enjoying experimenting. I set down my pen as a thought struck me. What if that was the point, or at least part of the point? What if she created this place for practice? I could only assume that practicing her ability to make things out of the odd was part of the reason she created the Hall of Lex, as Carson and I'd started calling it. He'd thought he was so clever when he came up with the name, since Lex was also an ancient Greek root meaning word, and there were words filling this place. I rolled my eyes, but I also smiled. In the six hours since Marcus, Asset, and I first stepped into the tunnel, Marcus's minions had set up lighting throughout the Hall of Lex and in the half of the city in the tunnel side of the canal. They'd even laid out LED ropes, creating a path from the hall across the bridge and up to the tunnel that was about a half a mile long. Not that I'd had much of a chance to look around the place, now that it wasn't eerily empty and quiet and dark, but filled with nezurettes, bustling around to move everything into the cavern and reset up camp. Once the task of recording Lex's words in an easier-to-read format was decided, a set suggested that only people who knew Lex well should be allowed in the subterranean hall, which meant the job of scribe went to a set, Alexander, Marcus, Carson, and me. And... Nick. I shivered, thinking about Asset's ancient, trusted companion. To say that Nick was different would be an understatement. Scares the crap out of me would be more appropriate. And it wasn't all the piercings or the black eyeliner making his crazy pale blue eyes look almost white, or the myriad of tattoos covering every visible part of him besides his face, all in various stages of fading as his body rejected them through regeneration. It was him. There was something about him that was more than a little unsettling, about how the air pressure shifted whenever he was in a room, and goosebumps covered my skin. Taking a deep breath, I shook myself in an effort to expel some of my Nick-inspired nervous jitters and returned my focus to my job. I stared at the wall and copied down Lex's words. Nguyen says that I'm picking up on how to use his shoot pretty quickly. I've grown so used to being able to do unbelievable things, alter memories, share my own memories, shift from one place to another, create a sort of bonding pheromone plug that protects you from withdrawals, transforms things into art, create something from seemingly nothing, that doing those things just seems normal. I bet you can't guess what your favorite is to help me practice. Did you guess? Guess, Marcus, or I won't tell you. Just kidding. You can't get enough of me creating the bonding block, mostly because you love shredding it to pieces. I kind of love that part, too. I love you, I love every version of you, and getting to know ancient Heru has been, I don't even know how to describe it. I just love being able to know you better. If I could spend the thousands of years between now and when you're reading this by your side, growing and experiencing the centuries with you, I would, I really truly would. Regardless, know this, Heru. However much time stands between us, however much distance separates us, I will find my way back to you. I will return to you, one way or another. Hey, I jumped, unintentionally flinging my pen against the wall and turned to glare over my shoulder. My glare withered the moment I laid eyes on him. Nick was standing in the archway, connecting this room to Nguyen's burial chamber. 
leaning his shoulder against the side and looking at me. More like staring at me, I thought. Creep? I cleared my throat and reached for my pen. Uh, hey? I heard about your mom, Genevieve. I offered him a none-too-friendly, tight-lipped smile. Good for you. When he didn't say anything for several heartbeats, simply continued to stare at me, I added, Did you want a trophy or something? His eyes narrowed, and he straightened, taking slow steps into the room. He wasn't walking strangely, not hunched over or anything, but something about the way he moved, the controlled, withheld intensity, reminded me of a stalking lion. Setting my notebook and pen on the floor beside me, I slowly got to my feet, keeping Nick in my direct line of sight. As he came nearer, I backed up a step. Another. My back touched the grooved wall, and I glanced past him, staring longingly at the doorway. I licked my lips and attempted a weak smile. Listen, I'm sorry. That was, um, rude. He was only a few feet away. He took another step and seriously invaded my personal bubble, staring down at me with those eerily pale eyes. I gulped, and my fingers searched the wall behind me for a way out, though I knew they would find nothing but Lex's words. What? What do you want? Nick's eyes narrowed to slits, and he pressed his lips into a thin, flat line. He inhaled, and, closing his eyes, grinned. Sensing that this might be my only chance to escape what was quickly turning into a totally freaky situation, I took a lurching step to the side, intending to sprint toward the doorway. Nick slammed his open hand against the wall, blocking my escape. You're afraid of me. Good. He leaned in closer, and I pressed my back against the wall as hard as I could to keep his body from touching mine. That will make this so much easier. What? What? I hated my stupid eyes for tearing up and balled my hands into fists to help me hold the tears in. Nick chuckled, the sound low and smooth. I don't trust you, he said, and I couldn't help but stare into his ice blue eyes. They were alight with fanatical intensity. If you're hanging around here just biding your time, if you're planning on following in your mother's footsteps, I'd rethink those plans. I haven't spent over 4,000 years doing everything I can to keep Lex safe, just so some barely manifested Nezheret brat could fuck it all up. My eyes widened, and a few of those traitorous tears escaped. I shook my head vehemently. I, I... He leaned in closer, and there was no way to avoid it. His jeans brushed against the bare skin just below the hem of my shorts, and his black t-shirt pressed against my tank top. My already too fast breaths sped up. I felt claustrophobic, trapped as I was between Nick and the wall. Nick grinned again, his eyes filled with warning. Don't even think about doing anything that would hurt Lex, or hinder what she has to do. Do you understand? His face was so close. I could see the individual flecks of blue, silver, and white in his irises. Do you? Swallowing compulsively, I nodded. Hey, Carson said from the doorway. Get away from her. Nick's lips spread into that predatory grin, which I was starting to suspect was his go-to scare the crap out of people expression, and he glanced over his shoulder. Two birds, one fucking stone, he said, so quietly that I doubted Carson heard him. He pushed away from the wall, from me, and stalked toward Carson. Pride welled in me as I watched Carson stand his ground. He stood taller, straightened his shoulders, and trained a steady glare on Nick. Don't you ever lay a hand on her, or, or you'll what? Nick stopped in front of Carson blocking my view of him. It wasn't that he was enormously tall or thick or anything like that. 
He was actually pretty trim and of average height for a guy, but Carson was kind of small. We were pretty much the same height. I o Nick pretended to lunge forward, and Carson jumped, laughing softly. Nick stepped to the side and turned so he could look from me to Carson and back. I think you need a new boyfriend, Katarina. Next time, look for someone with a spine. I'm not... He's not... While Nick's attention was on me, Carson threw himself at Nick, who spun, took a hold of Carson by the throat, and slammed him back against the nearest wall. Carson spluttered and kicked and clawed at Nick's arm, but none of it did any good. Nick glanced at me. Like I said. Let him go, I shrieked, finally breaking out of my terrified stupor. I took several lurching steps across the room toward them. Why are you doing this? Why? Nick returned his focus to Carson. Because there's a traitor among us, and I want to make sure he... His eyes flicked to me. Or she doesn't fuck up what has to happen. He seemed to catch himself. I've been watching you, Carson, ever since you got that position as one of Alexandra's monitors, you disappear in the ought sometimes, and I can't break through the cloak. He cocked his head to the side. What are you hiding? When Carson didn't respond, Nick squeezed his neck, and Carson's eyes bulged. Nikure, release the boy, Asset said, her words slicing through the tension. She was standing in the archway, her hands on her hips and her expression thunderous. Nick leaned in closer to Carson, growled something unintelligible, and letting go of the young Nejere, stepped back. Go find Heru, Aset said to Nick as she stepped into the room. He's up on top with the others. Lex's family has arrived with Dominic and Nephi, and he may need assistance. To my surprise, Nick bowed his head and strode out through the arched doorway. Aset looked at Carson who was gasping and clutching his neck as he leaned against the wall. You, go as well. I need to speak with Katarina alone. Carson shook his head. I'm not leaving her to go. I almost couldn't believe a set was capable of sounding so harsh, so commanding. With a reluctant look at me, Carson walked away too. I watched him leave wishing I could chase after him. You should be careful of him. I nodded vehemently. I didn't even do anything to provoke him. Nick's just so... I wasn't talking about Nick. What? I blinked at a set, scrunching my brow and shaking my head. Be careful of Carson. Nick was not lying. Carson is cloaked during brief almost undetectable moments in the art, and we can't figure out why. I was still shaking my head. I'm sure it's just an, I don't know, a misunderstanding or something. Perhaps, Aset said. She closed the distance between us and wrapped a comforting arm around my shoulders. She smiled, but it didn't quite banish the hard glint in her eyes. I sincerely hope you are right. I searched her eyes. Nick, he thinks I might be a traitor too, like my mom. I looked at the floor. Asset gave my shoulders a squeeze. Nick takes his duty very seriously, and all he knows of you is that your mother betrayed Lex by harming her sister. She nodded, more to herself than to me. I'll speak with him, clear things up. He won't bother you again. I smiled at her weakly. Um, okay, thanks. Now, come. She guided me through the archway and into Nguyen's burial chamber. You're missing all the fun. Lex's mother fainted as soon as she saw Alexander, launching the grandmother into giving Alexander the scolding of a lifetime. And when I left, Lex's father was giving Hero a piece of his mind, and Hero was barely holding his tongue. She laughed softly, 
the sound echoing off the solidified art like hundreds of tiny bells. It is a scene I shall watch over and over again in the art.' 